afternoon, everybody. I had a few people text me conflicts today, and uh, I'm expecting a few more to arrive. We're going to do the bulk of the class today on the worksheet that we started out at the end of class, uh, last class. But um, before that, I want to talk about cash flow statement a little bit more. And class may not be quite as long as usual, which won't break anybody's heart, but I had a, my laptop crashed sometime today from the, the class after a class I taught this morning. And uh, when I went to fire it up uh, for this afternoon's class, it was dead on arrival. The on button didn't work. I got nothing out of it. And I took it down to the IT guys at uh, 4 o'clock. They thought they were going to bring it back to life. They wound up taking the hard drive out and installing it in a alternative uh, chassis that they had and with hopes that we could make it by class time today and then turned out none of the drivers poured it over. So uh, they're going to have to work on that till tomorrow. So tonight I'm working on a uh, substitute laptop just to record the class, but it, uh, all of my files for today's class are not available. So. Uh, uh, not all. We had I had a couple videos queued up that we didn't get to last class that are important that I want to talk about, and then the exercise itself that I want us to go through that uh, slow enough that we understand where every number comes from and how long that takes. Uh, we will we will uh, dedicate that time. Before we get to that, though, uh, I do want to kind of review a couple of the things. Uh, in the form of, of a couple of videos that, that uh, we can look at. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with one that is just how to read and analyze a balance sheet like a CFO. We are moving to doing our own analysis on a balance sheet and an income statement for Vegas Supply. And uh, we'll take a look from an accountant's perspective of how he sets up a spreadsheet, what he does, what he looks at uh, to analyze uh, the financial statement, and then we're going to apply that knowledge to uh, our uh, example with Vegas Supply when, uh, in, in a while. We'll do, that, we'll do that in slow motion so that everybody knows where every number can, comes from uh, and everybody gets the same answer, or at least a similar answer, uh, is what we'll do. Welcome back. Um, I'm going to need some handouts for you, and I will look for them in a minute. We're going to uh, show a video uh, first, and during that time, I'll look for some handouts because we're going to use them today, and uh, you will you will need them. So here's a little bit on uh, how to read. I guess we're going to need this thing turned on. Right. How to read and. Uh, analyze a balance sheet like a chief financial officer. None of us are a chief financial officer, I don't think. I have been one. Uh, title on my business card, I am not a great one. That's not my, my fun zone. Uh, I, I'm able to do it. You guys will be able to do it too, but that's not what this class is about. This class is about being able uh, to take a look at our numbers and then drive the company accordingly. So we'll watch this. This is about a 20 minute video. We'll talk about it a little bit and uh, then we'll move on. So I'm going to show you how to read and analyze the balance sheet like a CFO does. So what we'll do is we'll jump into my computer here and I'm going to show you an example balance sheet for a company called Crab Cake Inc. And what we'll do is we'll go over the structure of the balance sheet as well as a couple of accounting definitions. And then we'll go over the approach itself. How does the CFO approach the balance sheet? Which can be summed up as saying it's a risk-based approach. Meaning a CFO looks at each line item on the balance sheet and think of all of the risks associated with that line item and then think of ways to hedge against these risks. <coughs> so we'll do all that and then toward the end of the video, I'm gonna show you a couple of financial metrics that you can apply that can quickly give you an idea of the financial health of the company based on the balance sheet. That's the topic of this video today, so stick around. We've listened to this guy before, but so you may recognize him. Voice. If you're new here, welcome, welcome. My name is Bill Hanna, I'm the financial controller. I'm a licensed CPA in the great state of New York, and I have over 15 years of experience in the field of finance. What I started out at Price Waterhouse Coopers as a, an auditor, 
and then I transitioned out to private industry, and then I worked my way up from a financial analyst position all the way up to a corporate controller position, which is what I do today. And this channel is all about giving you the summary or the juice of my experience over the last decade and a half. And I do this here in the YouTube channel, as well as on my website through blog posts, an online course, and templates. So go ahead and check that out as well. All right, so diving into the balance sheet here, this is a balance sheet for a company called Crab Cake Inc. And it's for the month ended December 31, 2019. And as we all know, the balance sheet shows the financial position of the company at a point in time. This is as opposed to the income statement, which shows the financial uh, performance of the company during a period of time. So here we're looking at a point in time, which is December 31 or December 31st, 2019. And the basic structure of the balance sheet is as follows. Uh, total assets, which is 14 million in this case, will always equal total liabilities and equity, which is saying that uh, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. Assets is what you owe equals what you own. So obviously assets is what you own in the company will equal, always equal what you owe, which is total liabilities and equities. Obviously liabilities is something that you owe to third parties. And equity is also something that the company owns, but it owes it to the owners of the company. This is where we come up with a positive or negative net worth. And it's the same, it's the same thing. This would be for your personal balance sheet, uh, for your, your, your personal. What, what do you own and what do you owe? And what's left over is whether you have a positive or negative net worth. That's your net worth. And when you look up sports figures, you can look up Tom Brady's net worth, you can look up Giselle's net worth, you find out she's worth twice as much as he's worth, uh, and that's from this. That's not how much money he makes, that's what he's, his worth is after you subtract out what he owes. So in our cases, all of us, if we took every, all the assets that we do own and we were to appraise them and put a value on them, you got that old pickup truck, what's it worth? 400 bucks, 4,000 bucks, 40,000 bucks, that's a number of an asset that you have. Your bank balance, how much cash do you have in the bank today? Because uh, balance sheet's today, right? It's this at this moment in time. Because I can appraise the truck and then go out and wreck it tonight. And it's not worth what tonight, what it was this morning before I wrecked it. My laptop was worth more this morning than it's worth now, right? Because it crashed on me. So, uh, our assets are always changing around, and every time they're they're declining in value, or maybe they're growing in value. Maybe one of your assets is a 1969 Chevelle Supersport that was uh, your your dad's, and and that's sitting away someplace. It runs. You've polished it. It's in good shape. You'll notice it at classic car auctions. That car is going up in value. That car is appreciating. So that asset is an appreciating asset. Many assets we have are doing that. You know, maybe, you, maybe you have cash in the bank, and that's appreciating at whatever interest rate the bank is paying, if it's a savings account, which is like 1%, right? Maybe that asset's in an investment account, and you've got a brokerage firm managing that money, or maybe Jake's managing your money. And if that's the case, we're ahead, right? We're 5% we're up of what we were at the beginning of the semester. Uh, if I'm managing that money, I've not done as well, right? You've already lost a little bit. So whether that asset is going up or down kind of depends on what the market is doing. Uh, it's a changing asset. Then our liabilities are, well, guess what? Maybe your house isn't paid off yet. So how much do you owe the bank? Uh, maybe your car isn't paid off yet. How much do you owe uh, the bank that owns that? What's the payoff on your car? What's the car worth? What's the payoff? That's the first thing the car dealers ask you when you go in to get a new vehicle, right? They want to know what you got, what you want to trade, and how they can take it away from you. It's kind of like what the approach is. But but it's 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 they're going through kind of this computation for one asset by itself. What is the what is the value of that asset, and what is the liability on that asset? So you're going to have to if 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 the asset if the, the car is worth uh, ten thousand dollars and you owe twelve then to do a deal, you've got negative equity, which means to do a trade, you have to write a check for $2,000, right? To pay off the bank so that they'll give you the fair market value, fair in quotes, market value for your truck, for your car. So aggregately, everything you own that can be 
uh, sold, typically when we're figuring assets, we're trying to, trying to figure the assets that are real. A company will put their accounts receivable as an asset. How much of that is real? They have bad debt on there. People that are never going to pay them are people that are going to discount when they do pay because of math. And so, you know, is that receivable, real receivable, or have you been trying to collect it for two years? You don't even know where they're at anymore. They moved. You know, you got a judgment. You went to small claims court, you got a judgment against them, but a judgment is of no value to you until you go find them and collect, right? It's just a judgment. It's a piece of paper. That's all it is. Uh, it might scare them a little bit, but that's that's all it is. It's, it's got a judgment from small claims court that has no teeth in it. Uh, actual judgments from big courts have no real teeth in them either if it's a civil judgment. It's up to you now to take that thing and go uh, collect. And it's nobody's going to help you collect. I went through a divorce one time. And in the divorce document, there was a tax liability. She was getting the house. The house is plural. And there was a tax liability against it. And in the divorce decree, it said, she will have to pay the tax liability. You know what the IRS said? The IRS said your name was on those houses when you bought them. And therefore, uh, you own that capital gains tax on that, those, that properties. And uh, yeah, you've got a judgment that says it's hers to pay. You go collect it. We're not going to. That's what the IRS said. Right? So, so litigation and judgments don't, aren't necessarily assets or liabilities. They are just there, and it's up to you to exercise them. So if I put all my stuff in a pile and sell it off at a sale, how much is it worth? That's the left side of that equation. If I go through the list and I write down everybody I owe money to, you know, there was a, uh, a pool tournament at, you know, at the, at the, the what was the old one? The Barney Stone used to have the pool tournament. So <laughs> I owe somebody a couple hundred bucks from that. Never paid it. That's a liability. I owe a bank this much for something. I owe, you know, a car pay, car or house payments. We add that together uh, with uh, against the assets, and if it's a positive number, uh, then what happens is I owe more than I have, and I have a negative net worth. Does that make sense? So that that formula works exactly the same way for a big corporation as it does for me with my house, my car payment, my house payment. And so the objective is, if you're going to retire, you might be better off with a positive net worth than a negative net worth. Because a negative net worth, you're going to either have to continue making those payments to make it up, or you're going to have to file bankruptcy, right? At some point, you, you owe more than you can pay. And if you're retired, you don't have any income but Social Security and whatever whatever means you put together in order to do that, uh, you know, to have income of some sort. Maybe you bought a franchise or maybe, you know, Maybe you run a, a pool cleaning company on the side or something like that that, that, that allows you to have income to, uh, to equal uh, the, the liabilities that you have. All right, I didn't mean to derail that, but I wanted to bring it into a real area where, that we already right. understand. So it's very easy. What you own in the company or assets will always equal what you owe, which is liabilities and owner's equity. All right, so let's go over assets real quick. So for assets, we'll always have current assets and then non-current assets or other assets. So basically current assets are those assets that uh, can be converted into cash within 12 months. So when we look at current assets, it will include uh, cash or cash equivalent. Uh, here we have uh, half a million dollars. We have accounts receivable, which is always the assumption is that you can uh, always turn it into cash within 12 months because you, you'll collect your accounts receivable. Uh, and then inventory, which is $3 million in this case, uh, and the idea is that all of these components, all of these three items on current assets can be converted into cash within 12 months, and that's why we call it current, right? So current means that it can be converted to cash within 12 months. And then we'll always have the other assets or non-current assets, which is in this case, uh, property, plant, and equipment, because the idea is that these are an investment in the future of the company. This is not something that the company intends to sell and turn into cash. And so this is uh, other assets here. So the total assets for the company is $14 million. And then we can jump over to the liabilities section. So liabilities uh, are also broken down in a similar fashion to assets, where we look at current liabilities, and then we look at non-current liabilities. So current liabilities, uh, similar concept. These are the liabilities or the obligations that are expected to be uh, fulfilled, that the company has to fulfill within 12 months. 
And so an example here is accounts payable. The expectation is that the company will pay its accounts payable within 12 months, of course. Uh, and then you have accrued expenses, and these are the uh, all of the other expenses that the company hasn't yet booked as payable, but based on the accounting principle of the accrual principle, the company needs to accrue for any liability or obligation that it hasn't received an invoice for. So even though you haven't received, received an invoice for a service or a product from a vendor, you still need to accrue for it, and this is based on the accrual principle, right? This is one of the principles of accounting, the accrual principle. So on accrual in small business, um we, we, we often will have accrual accounts that are a little bit odd. Uh, they seem odd. Uh, uh, the accrual account might be that uh, I tell you that I'm going to, I like the way you're working, and I'm going to give you a bump. I'm going to give you a commission on some deals that you put together. When you put those deals together, and I'm going to pay at the end of the year uh, whatever those commissions are. My accountant better set up an accrual account for that as it goes. Otherwise, guess what happened? The boss forgets about it, and you're wrong. I mean, you're, you're being wrong in that case. The company did not set up an accrual account, did not tuck away money in an accrual account. Another accrual account is sometimes a short-term account. Let's suppose you paid uh, salaried people monthly instead of weekly, and so if salaried people are being paid monthly, then that will be an accrual uh, until you actually give them the check on at the end of the month. So during the month, you're accruing what they've earned so that you, 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 your books are correct at all moments of time. So companies need to establish accrual accounts. There are various things that you would put in an accrual account. You can be creative. You can put in an accrual account a purchase of a new piece of equipment that you want to make. And so you will save for it in an accrual account where you are accruing money uh, to then at some point in time go out and make that purchase. So it's a set aside of sorts, but it's but it's earmarked. It's got it's got a purpose already stated on the financial records. So when we look at a company, we're going to go through those accrual accounts carefully and see what commitments they've made to pay things that are not against hard invoices. So but they're but they're obligations, and companies will tend to if they're shady will tend to not accrue things, and then will tend to skate by without paying. If, and, and, and some of those things, if you do those, they're against the law. If you've accrued pay for people that you haven't paid yet, and you choose to never pay them, that those employees, if they've earned the money, they can go to the state of Utah, and they can go to the Department of Labor, who pays for their lawyer to come after you and get that money. And it didn't, you didn't show it on your financial statements because you were shady, you know. And and but if you're if you're living clean and, and reporting things right in your business, you will have an accrual account established, and therefore you've also set aside the funds to make good on those promises. And like I said, some of those promises are not just casual handshake. If anything to do with somebody's pay, that's sacred. You have to pay it. And the company has to do that. You, you, it's okay if you delay it. You know, you can pay it at the end of the quarter, or end of the week, or end of the year. But you better set it aside and have it in a, a cool account, or else uh, you'll tempt, you'll be tempted to do something wrong. And and that's not uh, that's not a place you want to be at a business. A public company really doesn't do that unless it's an accident. I mean, they, they the public companies that are that are audited. Uh, they don't do that, but they will have large accrual accounts sometimes that there will be a note on the annual report that says what is in that, why why it's there, and what it's earmarked for. So uh, accrued expenses, 300000 and then we have deferred revenue, 500000 Deferred revenue basically uh, is, you can think of it as prepayments from customers. So as a company, you are receiving cash from your customers for a future product or service that you will deliver to them in the future. But the reason why we record it as a liability is because this becomes an obligation for the company, right? So you receive cash, you record the cash as a debit, but then your credit is deferred revenue, which is a current liability, because this is still an obligation for the company to fulfill. Uh, and so 500,000 in this case is deferred revenue, and that will give us a total current liabilities of $8.3 million. And then we'll jump over to non-current liabilities, and these are the liabilities that we don't expect to pay for the next 12 months. So here we have a long-term loan or long-term debt of $3.5 million. 
And that gives us total liabilities of 11.8 million. And then after that, what's left over is gonna be the stockholders or the shareholders equity of 2.2 million, which can be, uh, you can think of it as subtracting total liabilities from assets. So if you take all of the uh, liabilities and pay it off from the assets, what's gonna be left over here is $2.2 million. And this is the what the owners of the company can claim as the equity in the company, $2.2 million in this case. And then obviously, as we said, total liabilities and equities, $14 million is gonna always equal total assets of 14 million. And this is one of the first things you look for when you're analyzing a balance sheet, right? Is total assets equal to total liabilities and equities? If they're not equal, then you're looking at a balance sheet that has an error in it, and you need to have that error uh, looked at first before you can even begin to analyze the balance sheet. So the first thing is uh, this number here, assets need to equal total liabilities and equities. And now that we've seen a quick overview of the balance sheet, let's talk about the approach of a CFO. How does a CFO approach the balance sheet? And we said at the beginning of the video that it's a risk-based approach, or what are the risks associated with each line item on the balance sheet? So let's dive right back in and look at the risk associated with each of the line items uh, beginning from the assets and going down all the way to liabilities. All right, so starting with current assets, the first item here is gonna be cash and cash equivalents. So a CFO will look at this number and say, okay, I have half a million dollars in cash. Um, I need to look at my current liabilities. So we look at accounts payable here and I'll see that my balance is $7.5 million, which basically is telling me that I need to pay off the vendors $7.5 million over the next, uh, say, 60 to 90 days. So I'll look here and say, okay, where is the money gonna be coming from to cover all of these accounts payable? If I only have half a million dollars in cash, basically I'll look here at accounts receivable and I see that I have a big balance. So $7 million in accounts receivable, this is expected to be collected normally in the course of business, uh, say between 45 to 60 days. So I'm expected to collect this number first uh, so that I'm able to pay off my accounts payable. So this is the first thing that the CFO will look at, which is the obligations. So the, the CFO looks at the obligations of the company uh, in relation to the cash position of the company to determine whether there's enough cash on hand to cover the obligations that are coming right up. And then the second thing that the CFO will look at is profitability. So we, we, ha we know that the uh, accounts receivable, $7 million, is gonna cover um, the uh, obligations that the company needs to pay in the next, uh, say, 90 days. But then what about profitability? Is this company profitable? Uh, meaning, is this a cash machine? If my cash is running low here and it's half a million dollars, am I making enough profits to be able to generate, to generate more cash so that I'm hedging against the risk of running out of cash? So basically, when we look here at the income statement, uh, looking for the company's income statement, and we see that net income is 120,000, which is adjusted for depreciation, when you put back depreciation, this is close to 200,000 for one month. So this is for the month of December 2019. So I can say, okay, on a monthly basis, I am profitable by about 200K, uh, which gives me a little bit more comfort uh, that um, over the course of a year, let's say, I'm gonna be generating somewhere around $2 million in profits, which will generate more cash to uh, improve my cash position. So to summarize for the cash and cash equivalent, the CFO will be looking at uh, two things, obligations, and then also looking at profitability, which in turn will create cash flow. The next item here on current assets is gonna be accounts receivable. So the CFO will look at two things when it comes to accounts receivable. Uh, they look at the balance and they'll say, all right, it's $7 million, so uh, I need to see an aging schedule of the $7 million. So the aging schedule is gonna show you the breakdown of the $7 million in terms of what the customer owe uh, by bucket. So the first bucket is gonna be current uh, accounts receivable or you know the accounts receivable that the customer is not late uh, on paying yet. And then it's gonna show you then the breakdown from 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Uh, so this way you can get an idea of like how much of this number is aged and that can give you an idea on how much of this number uh, can be expected to be bad debt. Basically, the customer is never going to pay this number. So when they ask for an aging report, he just explained it. Uh, I want to pause it here to, so we can look at this. So the aging report, this is the current stuff. This is the current stuff. This is the stuff that's out um, so many days. And usually, we'll, we'll do an aging report, depending on the kind of business you are, on what those periods are. Maybe. Uh, 90 days, you know, maybe 60 days, maybe 30 days, 30, 60, 90, 120, you know, for those columns. Those columns will be whatever number your company agrees on. Uh, in this case, it looks like this is over 90 days past due. So that's three months they haven't paid their bill. So now if I'm looking at, at counting on that number, I'm going, 
14 million dollars is over three months past due, how likely are we going to get that? You know, if they haven't paid already, there's a problem. And and maybe it's maybe they are going to be good for it. Maybe we agreed to that in the first place uh, because a lot of companies have different policies of a of a 30 day. Um, you know what? At what point in time do we get mean with the customer? Small family businesses really have this as an issue um, because, you know, when you look at the aging report, what happens is something that you haven't bothered them here, they figure you're not going to bother them here either very much, and they don't know at what point in time you really mean it. You know, it's like when they, my mom uses my middle name, now I know she means it, right? And so at what point, you know, Verizon and T-Mobile have got their aging report figured out, don't they? They know at what minute they're going to shut off your phone service. That doesn't pay the bill, but that keeps you from racking up any more. So they, they don't have a discussion about that. In small companies, we need to have a discussion about that because we want to strengthen our company. I don't want anything over here. I want, I want everything as much as possible to be current. And whatever my terms are for current, if I'm running the movie theater, my current column should be almost all of my revenue, right? Because people buy tickets. If you're to a con, people pre-buy tickets, right? So there's an accrual, right? So they've got to deliver something or refund something. They better put that money aside because what happens if the show is canceled? If this, what's that? They, you've got to have the means to refund them or the fine print that says you ain't going to do it, <laughs> you know, or else they're going to get lawsuits against you. So you know, and a, a, at to a con. Most of their sales are refundable sales. Of course, they will try to replace it with a ticket of like value uh, that they haven't sold because a seat at Tuacon is a, uh, a, uh, a, a, has a shelf life, right? It's no good after the show's over. You know, it's only good for the next show. And so it's like, you know, what are Super Bowl tickets worth at halftime? You know, <laughs> they're worth, you know, quite a bit less than they were, you know, two hours earlier. And, and so uh, that accrual column for, for those types of businesses is, is not, a, not a column. The accrual account is important. Uh, if you're in a cash business, then this not, these numbers should not be very big because most of, your, most of your stuff gets paid for. And we noticed that that's one of the differences between Tesla and the other automotive manufacturers. Tesla gets more cash up front for their cars uh, in, in deposits than any of the other dealers uh, of, the, of the big dealerships. There's, there's, you know, the exotic, you know, Bugatti gets cash money too, uh, and Ferrari gets cash money too. But uh, uh, most, uh, most companies don't. Uh, they, they get cash after they build it, and, and some of that cash, if you're a car manufacturer, some of that cash is a car you sold to Stephen Way. So you don't get money until, you know, whatever, your agreement with the dealership is, right? Of, of when they pay their bills. And right up front, you may expect not to get it for two months or whatever the aging uh, or the flooring plan is that the dealership has. So an aging report is never going to look the same for two different businesses, but it's always going to be a gauge that we're going to look at that tells us some information. And if I want to strengthen the company, I can look at how can I move this stuff to go away because when I look at this stuff that's here, I've got a total of uh, $38 million out of 120. 38 out of 120 is a high percentage of money that's rotting. We're not collecting it faster. So if I can speed up collection of this stuff, then my company's got more cash to work with, right? And I'm, I'm st a stronger company. And so as he's telling us, this is an important thing that we are going to want to be looking at as we're analyzing. So the older the accounts receivable, the more likelihood that you're not going to collect it. So that's why it's important to look at that aging schedule of accounts receivable. And then the second thing that the CFO will look at is the uh, day sales outstanding. Uh, so basically, day sales outstanding is a financial statement or um, a balance sheet metric that will show us um, how far or how long it takes uh, so here we have day sales outstanding, which is the number of days it takes to convert sales to cash, which basically takes the uh, accounts receivable balance divided by credit sales 
and then multiply it by the number of days in the period. And to apply this to our example here, if we take um, the accounts receivable balance, which is uh, $7 million, divided by credit sales, $4 million, which we can see here in a balance sheet, or the income statement rather, if we switch over to the income statement, we have sales of $4 million, so we take that number and we uh, plug it here, so we have seven million AR divided by credit sales, um, $4 million times 31 days, this happens to be a month with so 31 days, um, then that gives us a result of 54 uh, days, so 54 days. So this is saying that the company uh, takes on average 54 days to convert its sales into cash. So uh, this number is a little bit on, on the higher end. You want this number to always be uh, somewhere around 30 to 45 days. Um, you know, if it goes up to 60 days, then it's a little bit above average. Above 60 days, then that'll be a bad signal. So this is a similar number on the output side of what you Lean Six Sigma uh, manufacturing people are looking at your backlog. How long does it take you to get uh, an order from placement to ship? That's the backlog that you have. How many days of backlog is your business? You know, at Donia Yacht right now, they are there are two years backlog, and that's a problem. They need to figure out ways to fix it. You've been working on your problem at, at Wild and Walnut, and you shortened that dramatically. Yeah. And 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 that's that's this is the other side of that. That's on the incoming side. This is days uh, sales outstanding this is on the outgoing side and and so it's an important number that that now some of it is inter industry specific of course some industries uh, operate on credit they operate slow uh, some uh, entities operate slow because they can if you're selling a medical supply in st george and you've got a physicians group that you're selling to they don't have the horsepower that IHC is if you're selling to, IHC as the big gorilla can drag out how fast they pay you. We saw in a video before that Amazon takes a long time to pay their vendors, right? We saw that. And, and, and that why, why did they do that? Uh, we saw Apple did it too, uh, and, and the same thing. And, and why did they do that? They do that because they can. You know, they're big and you want their business. So they'll drag you out on, on how, how fast you turn cash. Uh, with them. Uh, the smaller companies don't have that horsepower. They need their supplier uh, and, and so you can, you can bully them into paying you faster in, in most cases, many cases. But this is another, it's a needle pointing at a number on a gauge. Part of our analysis is to knowing is that a good number or a bad number? Right now it's just a number. So we're going to learn about what good numbers are and what bad numbers are by looking at the RMA data for our industry, right? And so that will tell us other companies like us that have the same kind of marketplace that's used to prepaying or not used to prepaying. Um, uh, you know, it, it, you know there, are, there are standards in some industries. There are industries that orders are all placed at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in January, but they're not going to take delivery of some of those goods until the Christmas rush. But they're preparing for Christmas sales a year in advance, and so orders will be placed, and sometimes when they will allow uh, a, 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 a fulfillment schedule that allows the customer to build an inventory, uh, or forces a customer to build an inventory, uh, and, and so that may be the standard of an industry uh, that, that, that you, have to, you have to know to know what that, that number, whether that's a good number or a bad number. These are the two things that the CFO will look at for accounts receivable. Uh, first is the aging schedule, and then they will look at day sales outstanding or DSO. The next item on our list is inventory, and basically when a CFO looks at inventory, they're looking at a, a balance of $3 million in this case, and they wanna make sure that none of it is nearing expiration or obsolescence. So if you have $3 million, $3 million worth of inventory, it doesn't mean that all of it is sellable. Right? Maybe some of it is not, you're not, you're not going to be able to sell. So if you have inventory, especially if it's like a food inventory, and a big chunk of it is a f uh, food products that are nearing expiration or are going to expire very soon, uh, so this is a risk here. So if, you, if you're looking at an aging schedule of inventory, you can tell by bucket how much of this inventory needs to be moved quickly in order not to uh, be written off or not to lose money on it. So uh, a CFO would want to look at a breakdown of what makes the $3 million in this case 
to determine how much risk is associated with this inventory, how much of it needs to be moved quickly. So now we've covered uh, all of the items. Stop for a second on inventory. Uh, we'll talk about this at a later time as well, but it's worth mentioning at this point, if I, if I have a marker that works. Uh, I typically will work with a company and, and, and when we look at the overall inventory that they have, there's kind of at least three buckets of inventory that I would ask them to consider. Uh, the the uh, inventory that is what I would call squeaky clean, if I even spell that right, I don't know. But squeaky clean inventory. This is this is stuff that you just haven't converted into sales yet. You you order a truck loaded, it's in the it's in the warehouse. Uh, it's in the yard, wherever it's at, it's ready to use, it's good inventory. Uh, but not all of your inventory fits that, 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 uh, uh, that thing. The, the, uh, the, I'm gonna put the next one is, is uh, I'm gonna put the word damaged in quotes because it's, it's, it's questionable inventory. It's, it, we got it in, it's, he, Maybe it's near its expiration date. Maybe it's if it, maybe if you're if you're a food-related company, expiration date's critical. How much of your inventory is nearing its expiration date when you can no longer use it as an ingredient in blue cheese at Lighthouse Foods? They keep track of their expiration dates big time. Uh, St. Helens Restaurant down Telegraph Road from Lighthouse has an inventory also. Uh, and it's their restaurant, right? They've got a they've got a, 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 a cooler and a freezer and shelves of, of current goods that don't need to be refrigerated. Some of their inventory is squeaky clean, ready to put in a steak dinner for you to eat. Some of it is questionable because they can only use that meat for two more days, and then they gotta do they gotta throw it out. They can't use it and sell it anymore. It's nearing expiration. So that's why the manager special might be that kind of amber, because they're gonna have to throw it away in two days, and, and so they want it. They'll they'll put a sale together, a special together, so they, they can get rid of it faster. All restaurants, I'm not picking on say no. All anytime you've got perishable goods, that's you have a certain amount of your inventory that's in this bucket. So do I count it as a solid asset for the company? Yes, we paid money for it, and we have it. And we can still use it today, but it's got something. It's got a scratch on it. We're going to have to polish that scratch out or put that on the inside of a door. And we got to we got to manipulate a little bit. It's not clean inventory. It's sellable, but it's not clean. And so this is a this is a, this number is a soft number when I see inventory levels of that. Then there's another bucket of inventory that is I'm going to call just it's flat out. Obsolete. You know, it's like when uh, you know, a supplier called you at the end of the year and go, hey, we got a great sale on this whatever. And you can buy a truckload of it for cheap. And you buy a truckload of it for cheap and you find out they're never selling it again. You've got it in your product line uh, and it's obsolete. And so it, it's, it's, it's last year's model. What are you going to do with that? You know, you, and, 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 and so you're going to have to take it to Costco and sell it. We're uh, You're going to have to take it to Costco and sell it. And, and that's, that's a totally wrong indictment of Costco. However, Costco is a viable uh, uh, place for, for manufacturer vendors to sell the goods that they have in this bucket. If you've got a model year that you know is going to be replaced with a new you know, Bluetooth version of it or whatever, what you, what you do is go to the super re retailers, you cut them a great deal while it still has good market value and let them dump it into their market because uh, it's still valuable stuff. It's just gonna, we're gonna have a red one next year and nobody will want the blue one anymore. But, we, but there's nothing wrong with it and so we'll see if, if, blue, if, if Best Buy or somebody will step up and buy that, make a model that we are in the process of moving out. There is, you know, there is somebody that gives you a special on stain. And, and now you've got this stain, it's perfectly good, perfectly new, but it's not one of your colors. So 
it, it's, it's inventory, it's good inventory, but it's not good because it's not, it's not your regular stuff. And so to sell this stuff, some of this needs to be thrown away. It's flat out objects. It's damaged in some way. You picked it up with a forklift, you moved it around one too many times. Uh, it, it, it got hurt over time. You know, in the steel yard, you know, stuff gets scratched up. You've got it painted so it won't oxidize. And every time you move it, and you're stacking up an I beam, what does it weigh? You know, 500 pounds an inch or something? You know, it's, it's, it weighs a ton. I mean, no, it weighs tons. And, and every time you move it, it, it lands hard when you set it down and, and it scratches and, and it's less than perfect. But you stack it around five times before you put it into the finished product. So it's got scratches on it. At what point in time should it be thrown away? In a real you know, beams, you can pretty much always salvage a beam, I'm thinking. But, but sheet metal, you can't. You know, and you go to Home Depot and you see the toolbox, it's got a big old whomp on the back of it where a forklift hit it. How did that happen? It didn't happen when it was being built. It happened when they were moving inventory from one place to another place. Somebody missed with the forklift. And, and now we've got something that they ought to just put it in a real scratchy dent sound because that drawer, the bottom drawer didn't even open. You know, it's, it's dinged up so bad. And, and maybe if they, could, if they can get some money out of it, they, they, they could. But, but these are the kind of things you could, you, could, you could donate this stuff, right? How much can you write off on a donation? It depends on who you're donating to, but lots of times you make up the number. And you'd support it based on what you paid for it. You could easily support it for what you paid for it, even though it maybe doesn't have a cash value of that anymore. But if you give it to, you know, what was it, Dixie Karen's here, the, what's that called that now, whatever it's called? Switch point. Uh, switch point. You give it to switch point. They, they have a very good need for things. You know, you've got a brand new mattress that goes on a wall bed and, and it's got a, a stain. Well, you put it in some place, the stain isn't from what you think it is. It's, it's just a stain, right? And, 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 and so, you know, anyway, it's not top good stuff, but it's something that you could, but if it's here, it's not obsolete, but it's damaged beyond what your customers would take. So most of the time, this area of inventory needs special attention for the company. From an assessment perspective, when I look at what you claim to be inventory, that's suspicious inventory value to me. I discount that out. If I'm buying your company, I don't want to buy that scratch stuff because your customer doesn't want it either. So saying you've still got it and it's worth something, that's a problem. Now, just to time out for a second, one of the things we're going to talk about as we kind of come out of this analysis state, we're going to talk about where you find cash in a company. Cash flow, as we understand a statement of cash flow, cash flow is telling a story. Most companies have cash crunches from time to time, or I know some companies it's just chronic. They always have a cash flow problem. They're always out of money. They always are trying to scrounge and manage money. They're, they're, I, I've been into, to, uh, I remember a plumbing company, I'll say the name because they're not no longer that name. Uh, the people who owned the company quite a few years ago it was a plumbing company called Dixie Plumbing. And Dixie Plumbing at that time, um, they had $60,000 a month in bank overcharge fees. $60,000 a month in overdraft fees. Now, just process that for a minute. That's a chronic cash flow problem that was costing them three quarters of a million dollars a year. Now, for a small company with four or five trucks, that's debilitating, right? So, so cash is everything in everybody's company. Finding cash, cash is king. If, if you don't have cash, at some point you don't have a business. Uh, managing cash and generating cash and creating cash is always something that the CEO has on their mind. Uh, this is a place for cash, right here. While, while I'm faced with facing, really, I ought to throw it out. Sometimes what I really need to do is I need to let the sales team see what we got. Stuff that can be fire sailed out. If I'm going to throw it out, what is my value? Whatever write-off values are. If you've got, if you've run out of cash, you aren't, you don't have tons of profit that you need to write off against anyway. A write-off is only good if you got a profit to offset it, right? So, so if you're, if cash is a problem, 
then you need to convert everything you can into CAC. Never let one of these going out of date things slip out of date to the point where it goes into this category. Never let that happen, so manage that like a hawk. And, and then figure out a way to sell the stuff that's obsolete. Uh, and, and, and you may not want to take your best uh, top salespeople off of what they're doing, you know, to sell the junk that you got. You may want to hire a team. I worked for a company by the name of Teleflex once upon a time in one of my lives. Uh, they had a medical division and we were in the aerospace business as well. Uh, Teleflex manufactures uh, control cables for most of the fighter jets. Uh, they're the platform approved uh, manufacturer for Lockheed and Rockwell and Boeing. And so in flight control systems, you know, fly-by-wire systems made by Teleflex. And the guy that, whose office was right next to my office, uh, he, had a, he had an interesting job. Uh, I, I was fascinated by his job. In fact, I learned quite a bit about uh, uh, a whole world that I didn't know existed. His job was to look at government contracts, uh, bid requests, requests for bid, uh, for our products, Teleflex products. And um, he would find Air Force bases around the world or, or airplane companies or repair facilities that needed to buy our flight cables uh, somewhere that went on the platform somewhere of the aircraft. And uh, so he would find a need, you know, the public bid, the, you have, you, everything in government and military has to be public, uh, has to go out to bid. So he'd find these bids for these cables and then he'd go through surplus. And he'd find an Air Force base that had one of those. And we'd get them, you know, we'd go bid on, on the junk one at an Air Force base and get it for a dollar. <coughs> and then he'd sell it for $100,000 to another Air Force base that needed it. And the Air Force wasn't talking to each other. And he did that all day, every day, year round. There was enough of that going on. And so what he was doing was he was selling this stuff right here. Some of it was owned by a customer. They'd already paid us once. And it's brand new. It's just never been installed on an aircraft. And so he'd go find where it was at, and, and nobody else wanted or needed it. You could only use it on that aircraft. So it was only good if you were fixing one of those airplanes. Why the government didn't, doesn't talk to each other, that still goes on. Why they don't talk to each other about their needs and their supplies, uh, that's our tax dollars being, being wasted, really. But, but that's a company that was focusing on how do we take obsolete stuff and find markets for it uh, and do things for it. In this case, it was a little bit of a, of a, of a twist on that on that model, but if you've got stuff that is not a value on your on your inventory list, you still have to report it because it's va it is an asset. It, but is but how how crisp of an asset is it really? You know, I got clothes in my closet that are never worn, and they're an asset, but they don't even fit me anymore. You know, so they're of no value to me. I ought to convert that to cash, right? I if if I was if I was looking at cash. That is something that's no value to Steve Carwell Inc. anymore unless I magically lose weight. And then, I, then it might fit me. I have a few things that are too big, too. Uh, and so just that's, that's planning ahead is what that is. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the retirement plan we're talking about. Uh, so, so managing this stuff, this is a place where we can find cash a lot of times. And we'll, we'll visit that again because we're going to be looking for other places that we can find cash in our business uh, that doesn't pain us, that we can we can we can manage our cash a little bit better, or we can find cash that we didn't realize that we had and utilize that um, uh, to the benefit of the company. And current assets. So the next item here is non-current assets or other assets, and we have here property, plant, and equipment. And when a CFO is looking at this balance of $3.5 million, they're asking themselves the question of, is this entire balance appropriate to be booked in a balance sheet? Meaning, is any of this obsolete? Like, if this is machinery or equipment, are we using all of it? or some of it is obsolete and needs to be uh, written off. Uh, so this is the risk here when you look at this number, uh, is to know the composition. No, look at a breakdown of the assets that are included here and determine whether all of them are in use, uh, all of them have a future uh, economical life for the company, um, so this balance is appropriate. Otherwise, if it's not, if a, a part of it needs to be written off, then uh, that, that's a hit to the P&L and that will reduce this number here on the balance sheet. All right, so now that we've covered assets, let's look at liabilities, and the first item in current liabilities is gonna be accounts payable. And when a CFO looks at this number here, the balance, $7.5 million, they think of two things in terms of risk when it comes to accounts payable. So the first thing they think of DPO, or days payable outstanding, which is basically the amount of time that the company takes on average to pay, uh, to pay its obligations to vendors. 
So each company has a unique cycle of payment. Uh, sometimes it's a quick cycle of 30 days. Uh, sometimes it's maybe 90 days or 120 days uh, when it's a, like a bigger supply chain when you have vendors uh, for your materials. So basically, the longer the better in this case. And the CFO will be looking to measure the DPO. And the DPO, uh, days payable outstanding, the formula for it uh, is purchases on credit divided by the account accounts payable balance and take that and multiply it by the number of days in the period and that would give you the DPO. And typically you want that number to be as, as long as possible so that uh, you wanna shrink your cycle of receiving from your customers and make this cycle as long as possible so you have an advantage. And this is like a cash flow advantage when you collect quickly and then pay off uh, on the longer duration of time. So uh, DPO is the first thing to look at. And then the second thing is gonna be aging. So, um, you know, similar to when we talked about accounts receivable, when also when you look at accounts payable, we wanna look at the aging um, of the composition of the $7.5 million to determine how much of it is current and how much of it is aged. Because the risk here is that if, if a lot of this balance is aged, meaning that we owe this for the past, let's say maybe six months or so, uh, this is a sign of trouble, right? So if the company has a lot of accounts payable that is aged or that is um, past due, it means that the company isn't able to collect in time from its customers and pay off its vendors. Uh, so that's why it's really important to look at aging. Uh, that will give you a quick idea. Obviously, when you look at the aging schedule, you want as much as possible of that $7.5 million to be sitting in the current section of the aging schedule uh, and not being past due. So this is what the CFO will look at when it comes to accounts payable. The next item is going to be accrued expenses, and we have three hundred thousand dollars. And I'm going to pause it for just a second back on accounts payable on the aging. Uh, this is a this is one of those it, it's it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of number. Uh, we saw this number. We heard the in the video that we watched uh, by the author of the book. Uh, we, he he said Apple went from uh, paying their bills in in. Uh, 30 some days, he gave us a, a number, to 120 something, which was a number. And, and he was saying, look how awesome that is, because they're telling their vendors, we will pay you, but when we feel like it. Remember, we laughed about that, because they're Apple and they can do that. That's awesome for Apple, because they've got cash, which means they could pay it faster, they just choose not to, and nobody has enough uh, muscle to make them pay faster. So they get by with that. But in my company, whichever one it's been, the people looking at that number are not just investors, they're suppliers. Dun & Bradstreet is looking at that number and they're giving us a credit rating based on that number. And if that number is, if I'm not paying my bills for 120 days, what that means is I'm jeopardizing companies that will want to sell to me. If I'm trying to change suppliers and I don't pay fast, they don't want it. They don't want me as a customer because I'm going to add to their cash flow problems. I'm making a bank out of my supplier. I'm using their money in, in, in my organization. And, and so that is one of the things. And when your company is looking at customers, we ought to be looking at that number from our customers as well. If we have access to it and can, that says their account, if their account's payable is out the roof, watch out. That means you might not be getting paid any faster, right? They expect them to pay the bill slow. And that's fine if you quote it accordingly and you account for your cost of money and you expect it's a good customer, it's Apple. I'm, so I'd love to have an Apple contract. I'm just going to put the cost of money into that contract because I know they're not going to pay me fast. But I know they're going to pay. They're good. The problem with smaller businesses is we don't know if they're going to pay. But they just stretch us out. Is that good, though? Well, that's why I say this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. You know, it's really smart to use somebody else's money until you piss them off. <laughs> and then it's not smart anymore. Or if you need additional credit or you need, you know, you need to have fast pay. So it's, it, it, there's not one answer on that. The one thing I learned this week is Big companies like to work on the little company's dollar in class and in life. I've learned that this week. That's very true. And, and you know, your question is that morally right? No. And and theoretically, 
that is been that's been uh, there's lots of court cases where it's gone to court with that being really one of the issues. The first one that I remember, uh, there's probably been lots of, but the first one I remember was uh, in uh, what became Black and Decker. Uh, Sears used to be a company, used to be a department store called Sears, guys. <laughs> there was a building in Chicago called the Sears Tower, the tallest one in, in the United States. And, and uh, Sears would, would rely on a vendor and add more business and more business to the point where most of that vendor's business, in this case it was Black & Decker, a, a precursor to Black & Decker, making drills for craftsmen. And they, they got to the point where so much of their business was dependent on Sears that Sears could dictate the pricing to them and could run them out of business. And the, 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 the company later sued and the court supported them. A, a, a Sears couldn't do that. That was unethical business practice. They called it predatory business practice, and that's a whole that's a whole category of, of court law now against companies. Is predatory practices aren't okay, and if they're doing it predatorily, uh, and so Costco, for example, if you try to go sell something to Costco, you have to bring financial statements to uh, the folks that are evaluating you at Costco that proves to them that if they give you the order that you're talking that you're asking for. That it is less than 10% of your company's income, so that you're not dependent on Costco. So they want to make sure you're big enough and strong enough that they won't get sued for these unethical practices. Where you know all of us would love to do business with Costco and have that business grow and grow, and it's real possible that I mean, in my mind, that Costco could be my only customer, and I'd be happy. You know, they got you know I'd have a little business operating, and Costco would buy everything I got. Costco won't let you do that because that leads to the temptation of them controlling our business and potentially playing dirty with us. And so that as a company, Costco's a high end, you know, high road company and they just won't they won't walk down that. And and I, I respect them for that. They they lose some potential products because of that, but all in all, uh, you can rely on the companies that they have enough horsepower that are selling things through Costco. Uh, and so that's a I don't know how I got off on that from this one, but sorry about that. Um, let's go back to what he's saying about. We said before the, the accrued expenses is what the companies are accruing for in terms of liabilities that haven't received, that the company haven't received an invoice from a vendor yet. Uh, so what the CFO would look at here is he would ask for a schedule of this number here, uh, just to determine whether the company is appropriately accruing for everything that it owes. Uh, so only when you see a breakdown of the number, that's when you can make that determination. So um, a schedule here will give you an idea. And then the next item is going to be deferred revenue. So uh, CFO will look at this number and, and think, okay, you know, this 500000 is received in advance from customers for future services or products. Um, you know, I need to know whether the company is going to be able to make good on this, um, on this obligation. So you know the you know the CFO would want to look at uh, and see what the customer is paying for. Um, let's say he's paying for a product, and then we'll ask the question: Okay, is this a product that we have in hand? Is this is this something that we need to manufacture from scratch? Are we going to be able to make good on this obligation here? Um, and so uh, you know you need to know what's um, you know what's included in this number here. And again, this is usually going to be a schedule uh, that you can obtain. Uh, the company should keep a schedule of all of the prepayments that are received from customers. So this covers pretty much the section current liabilities. Now we come to non-current liabilities and the CFO will look here and see that the company has a long-term debt of uh, 3.5 million. And so the first question is to ask for a breakdown of this number uh, to see, just to see the maturity, right? So you wanna see the breakdown by maturity date of you know, when do we expect to pay off this number? Is this made up of loans that are like three year or five year or 10 year loan? Uh, so basically then you can plan in the future, uh, you know, how you're gonna pay off this loan. It's similar to when you own a house and, or a property and you wanna know how long is the, the mortgage, right? Is it a 10 year, 20 year, 30 year mortgage? It's the same thing here. If you have a long term debt, uh, first thing you wanna know is how long will it take to pay off or what is the maturity date um, of this loan? So you come to total liabilities and it's $11.8 million. And there are a couple of financial metrics or KPIs that you want to be using here to make sure that the company uh, financial health is not something that is in jeopardy. So the first thing you want to compare is total liabilities. Uh, you want to compare that to equity. 
And this is a financial metric here that is called a debt to equity ratio, which is the relative proportion of shareholders' equity in debt used in uh, financing the company's assets. So the formula for it is liabilities divided by equity. And if we apply this here, uh, liabilities is $11.8 million divided by equity, which is $2.2 million, and it will give us a result here that is 5.4. Uh, so this number 5.4, um, you know, is saying that the company is using 5.4 times more debt than stock uh, to finance its business. Um, you know, this could be a sign of too much leverage, but it might be also the company taking advantage of low interest rates. So there are two sources of financing for the company. It's either raising debt, uh, in this case, which is the long-term debt, or selling stock, which is equity. I want to back him up just a second to that graph that he had up right there. He talked, he, he talked about the word leverage, too much leverage, and it's debt to equity that we're always talking about when we talk about leverage companies. And different industries leverage at different rates, uh, at, at different percentages to be normal. The worst leveraged businesses that, uh, when I say worst, the, the, the furthest leveraged out businesses that I know of are banks. Uh, banks are able to loan out lots more money than they have. And that's leverage. So they're loaning out money they don't have. How good would that be? You know, and they're getting payments on money they don't have. Now they're they're making repayments on that to to wherever they got the money from. But they're you know most most uh, people won't allow us to leverage out that far. You know, if we if you've got a, a stock margin account and you're buying uh, you're buying stock on margin, that means you're buying stock with somebody else's money. Uh, in some cases, depending how the margin is set up. And, and, and most uh, brokerage houses will only let you do that if you're Warren Buffett because they know you can back it out in a different way. Most of our uh, creditors aren't going to want us to be leveraged. And, and so the, the more the leverage, the, the, the bigger that number is, the more uh, the risk is of not being able to close that gap or be able to, they're too leveraged. They owe too much money compared to what they have. And, and why banks are able to do that, by the way, is they, they're able, the, a bank's number, this is 5.4, a bank's number will often be 22 to 32 leveraged out. So that means for every dollar they loan, uh, I mean for every $32 they own, they only have one dollar of their own assets. So they're loaning out lots and lots and lots. Yes, ma'am? So you, they get that back on <laughs> they, they really are. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that's an ethical question that we have some, you know, there are laws in place, like you can't, you know, you can't charge more than, what, 142% interest or something, some stupid they number. Stuff that, like, I, I stopped banking with them like 20 something years ago, but like when I had a bunch of little babies and finances were really tight, I'd get, so we'd be like waiting for payday and I'd go put my deposit in and they'd hold the deposit till the end of the day and if anything cleared during the day, they would put a finance charge on every single thing yep. during the day and they wouldn't credit you the deposit until after the business day. Every That's time. That's the jerkiest thing. Every time. Yeah. You know, and international wire transfers is an example. You know, when you, when you accrue it, when you, when you spend money and, you know, you use your debit card for hundred thousand dollars or whatever a business tra transaction um, uh, they, they ding your account instantly it's milliseconds right but when you transfer money back into that account if it's an international transfer they have three days to do it and that three days is called the flow and so that's that's free time for them to use your money for whatever purpose they want to use during that short period of time now for you'd say three days isn't a lot of interest but no it's not but when you've got uh, you know, half a billion dollars or ten billion dollars, it's a big number. And, and the banks make money off of that. I don't, that's a side note that we went on that. But the, the idea of, of uh, leverage for a bank works okay because what's the bank's insurance? Insured by the government. FDIC insured. Which means that my money's not at risk if the bank leverage is out too far. Uh, because the feds are going to come in and make them be good on it. And the feds in most cases are going to close the bank. 
if you've noticed, I, I don't have a list that I've brought here. This is a, a side track, but I've got a list of the banks here in St. George that we that we know um, and 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 do business with. Uh, it's very interesting as as you get under the hood of the banking industry. How many of them have gone bankrupt in St. George under our nose? Uh, lots more than you think. We hired a lady in our um, our cashier's office at one point in time uh, who had been traveling. She changed jobs uh, because she her previous job was 100% travel, and as she wanted to be home with family uh, a little bit more and change her lifestyle, and so she took a job at the college here. And we got to know her and talk to her job uh, that was 100% travel was she worked for the, the uh, uh, federal banking system and her job was to close banks down. And so she was part of a team that would travel to anywhere and uh, they had, I, I learned a lot, it was fascinating about the dance of closing a bank uh, because they, you know, you can, you can change money in an account in one keystroke. And so if the owner of the bank or the president of the bank has any warning, you know, five seconds warning is enough for them to move millions of dollars out of and into, you know, if they're, if they're unscrupulous uh, uh, company. And many of them are. Uh, many of them aren't unscrupulous. They just aren't, they don't manage this leverage properly. And they get over their head to the point where uh, they're quietly um, closed by the FDIC. Uh, the feds will close the bank. Usually when they close the bank, they have a reopening of the bank under a different name a few seconds later. So the whole thing is orchestrated behind the scenes. The bank doesn't know about it. Uh, and the feds haven't figured out exactly how they're going to lock the door, lock the accounts, lock the servers, all at the same coordinated moment. And the buyer that's going to, that that's going to take the bank over has already signed all the papers and has everything in order under secrecy. And then, boom, the bank changes. And there were at least five or six banks here that you know that, that happened to. Um, and and, uh, and that kind of makes you feel weird and good at the same time. It's kind of like, what? You know, I, the, that bank on the boulevard that we drove back and forth past all the time, two of them were on, were on St. George Boulevard. One of them was on television. Does the FDIC just like, make all the notes good in there? Every deal is different. Um, uh, and I don't know that, that I've not been on the inside track of taking over a bank, so I don't know as much as I need to know to answer that question. But I, it's done commonly and often. Cash Valley Bank has been one of them that's bought a couple banks here uh, that were in those circumstances. Um, Alta Bank is actually has been purchased by Glacier under the same circumstances. Um, Sun Bank, Sun, that's a, Sun Capital was one. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're they're you know all the names, and you know, one of the bank facilities is now the the marijuana distribution store in St. George. It's like that became a real estate office and then and then now it sells weed, which is pretty funny from renting out money, uh, doing people's note, mortgages. Um, so, it's, but that's all, most of the time when a bank turns like that, we want the public to be protected. So the government, since it has the means to protect the, the depositors and we have electronic means to keep a run on the bank from happening. So what would the bank, where the bank would get into super trouble is if all of us tried to get our money out of the bank on the same day, just like it happened in the Wild West, right? When that happened, the bank would collapse and people would really be out their money. The first ones in line would get their money, the last ones in line wouldn't, and every, everybody else gets screwed. And so, you know, to prevent that from happening, the government set up all kinds of checks and balances electronically and in, in real, real, uh, uh, real life, and, and the, the is not as worried because they have the means in place to take over uh, and and then and then sell and under different terms, you know, under the terms of they uh, most of what uh, uh, the banks uh, uh, assets and liabilities we look at banks financial statements most of it's not in deposits from people like us it's that's small amounts it's more the the big loan packages that are bought that are conglomerated and bought and sold uh, that wound up. Uh, forcing ultimately those all went uphill or downhill I guess you'd want to say more when back when we had the the loan collapse uh, when Fannie Mae went down and uh, Countryside Bank the two biggest 
uh, lending banks in the U.S. behind the scenes. They lent two banks, and um, they they ultimately got uh, accumulated that bad debt, and they didn't have anybody to sell it to at that point. So the federal government pushed them into closure, and and so their depositors weren't protected because notice that your FDIC account is only good up to a hundred thousand dollars or on some accounts up to $200,000. And that seems like a lot of money to us, but on the banking scheme, that's, that's pocket change. They're, they're, they're lending money out in packages of hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's their assets that get wishy but, but But other banks are always interested in those packages because they think they can repackage them and regrade the risk level and resell them uh, at profitable. And I don't know enough to know how they do that all. Sure. Maybe we'll have a banker come talk to us. That'd be kind of nice in class. Have him tell us a little bit about what, how it works behind the scenes. Once again, it was a a goat trail. I apologize for going down, but it started with the word leverage because we haven't heard the word leverage that often and don't know what it means. This is what it means: uh, it, where we this number gets too big, we're too leveraged out. That means we owe more than we can back up. With Advantage of low interest rates. So there are two sources of financing for the company. It's either raising debt, uh, in this case, which is the long-term debt, or selling stock, which is equity. And so uh, if each one of them has a cost to the company, and it's up to the company to determine which one is cheaper uh, if the interest, rela interest rates are low in an environment where the feds are lowering the interest rate, uh, then it makes sense for the company to raise more money uh, from uh, debt over financing. And so in this case here, uh, you look at this metric, and you can determine the uh, debt to equity ratio. The other financial metric to look at here is the servicing of the loan itself, which is the interest coverage ratio. So this is measuring how many times can a company cover the interest payment from earnings in a, a given period. And so basically you take the earnings or EBIT in this case, earning before interest and tax, divided by the interest expense. And so in this case, it's 250,000, which we can get here from the income statement. Uh, when you take the um, you know EBIT, which is earnings before interest and tax, 250,000 divided by 80,000, which is the interest expense. Again, that's from the income statement here as well. $80,000 of interest expense, um, and the result is 3.1. And so this is saying that the company can cover its interest payment three times or 3.1 times over its earnings. And so this is good. So the company has makes enough in earnings to cover its interest by a factor of three. So this is a good sign that the company is in fact is able to service its interest um, on uh, the actual loan. There are a few other important ratios such as the liquidity ratios, uh, quick and current ratios that are used by CFOs to analyze the balance sheet. And also there are financial leverage ratios such as the debt to capital ratio and uh, debt uh, to asset ratio as well as the financial leverage ratio. And these are all the important ratios that the CFOs use to analyze the company. I'm gonna leave a link to this file down below in the description uh, in Excel so you can download it and look at the balance sheet, the income statement, and, and the actual ratios that are used here. So you can find a description, you can find the link in the description down below. So the link in the description below will lead you to a product on my website. All right. Uh, so that was a lead up and an introduction to what we're going to uh, dig into at this point after we take a break in a second. But before we go on break, uh, we have handouts from uh, last class. And several of you had excused absences last class. And I have, I have seven copies of this handout and six copies, yeah, maybe there's seven. Yeah, seven copies of each of them. So who was not here and needs a copy? Two, three, four, five. Did you, you, you brought your copy? Okay, so so if others of you forgot to bring it, you can get one if, as long as those that didn't get one to start with have one. So as you go out on break, pick up one of each of these because when we come back, we're going to dig into uh, filling this out and doing some ratio analysis ourselves for Vegas Supply. See you in 10 minutes.
it doesn't last very long. What wrote me in here? Uh -huh. Interesting question. I, I was, they, they wanted to set up a manufacturing uh, university program that they called, uh, which gave, uh, well, I guess backing up before that, there were, there were five companies in the area that said, we have people that we would like to promote. Uh, they've been here for 10 years or whatever, and we like them, they're reliable but we can't promote them because our corporate policy requires them to have a degree for that job, the next job available job. And they're not gonna give up their family, they can't go, they're not gonna quit their job and go back to school, that's just not in the cards. So could we build a program that would cover the stuff that they would have gotten in a business degree in, in a compact form and allow them to go to school uh, as, and still be full-time employees of their company? And so the ice cream plant, Blue Bunny, um, actually Cabinet Tech was part of that. Uh, uh, Stampin' Up was part of that. And uh, 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 oh, uh, Viracon was part of that. And uh, Milliken was part of that. So they all had corporate offices somewhere else, and that was a rule. And so we said, well, we'd like to do that, but there is no such thing. And we looked at colleges around, I was a consultant at that point to try to answer that question. And we looked at colleges around the United States and we couldn't find one that had a program like that. So we wrote a grant to the Department of Labor saying, we'd like to develop a program like this that does this, but we need money to do that. And so we got $2 million awarded by the Department of Labor to develop that curriculum and the college had to do that. So my first task was to write the curriculum, kind of like what I'm teaching now, mm -hmm. but to, to write that curriculum. And so I did that, and they said, well, that's great, but you, you have to teach it. It's like a franchise. you got to show us that it works. And so they said, you got to teach it. You need to teach it to show that it's successful. And in, they, they tracked, I believe, over a three-year period, I believe they tracked maybe 105, I can't remember, of students that took the course or the, the program. And the crazy data out of that was that almost all, I think there were four that did not during that period of time of them getting the training get a, a raise or a promotion. Or, a, you know, the, the students helping, the, the skill sets were helping them in the real world. And so that was just awesome. And we had to report that to the federal government. They came in a lot of it. They talked to the people, called them up, and got firsthand, you know, how was that program? Was it successful? They talked to the companies that supported it. And uh, so that's the start. And then I, it was fun. You know, I enjoyed doing it. I was trying to retire. And uh, I had clients in Salt Lake and, and, uh, and LA. I just kind of dwindled it down to that. But I was still traveling all the time. And, and, uh, School said, "Well, why don't you teach this and teach some stuff?" And so it's you know it's no money to work at a job, but it's uh, it's fun. Yeah. So my next question to you is: is if this is the only course that somebody takes, what do you, as the teacher, of this course think that you can take from this class right here that we're in with you? Um, it'd be better to talk to the people that that, that actually have done it um, and it. You know, what, what, there's no magic, except for, I mean, you only learn what you teach yourself. I don't teach anybody, I mean, we just talk about the topics, and then people choose to learn on their own. Uh, and the people that do that, they're dialing up their talent and value added in companies. Uh, we've had probably 
I bet by now we have 15 that have graduated from here that have become plant managers of good size operations. So they've, they've worked their way up. This class didn't do that. They did that. But, but, but it gave them the tools to, to kind of know what else they needed to learn in order to do that. Uh, and, and that's not the end game for everybody. And everybody doesn't want to be a plant manager. We've had you know, probably that many or a few more that have started their own companies and got their own gig going and you know, doing it. And, and uh, uh, we've hired here at the college, we've hired, I think, five or six of the graduates and wound up applying their technical knowledge and teaching it. And uh, a couple guys in IT and computer world, a couple guys in the machine world came out of this and did it in the, their companies outside of this and then we hired them for their skill sets. Uh, so they've worked their way up from where they were. You know, a lot of people, uh, uh, it's amazing how many people, in fact, nobody in their family's going to college. And this is the first that they've had to, have to do this. We've had a lot of uh, graduates that have gone on and gotten their, their bachelor's degree or associate degree or, or a master's degree because it gave them the confidence that they can learn. They're not too old to learn. They're not too old to to fit it into this, it's a sacrifice to fit into your schedule. Just coming to this class is a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, but people prove to themselves and their family that they can do it and, and still have a life and still have a job. So that gives them the confidence to go get their MBA or go get a degree. We've had a lot of people that have, I haven't even asked this class, but there's probably a fair percentage of people in this class that have bachelor's. You know, they've already gone to school and something. They've gotten a degree that they haven't used, or you know, and they, now they want to learn really more practical stuff. You know, and that's a that's an indictment on the education system. We, gra we graduate people that can't find a job. You know, in their in their specialty. That's messed up. You know, why do we have a you know marine biology program in Utah? <laughs> How many marine biologists are there here? There's a few. But there's not, you know, there's not class after class after class of them, so they all got to leave. The labs they, are a long way away, yeah. They, they are. They are, which is probably bad. Go fishing all the time. Not so bad. So yeah. it's kind of, that's how it happened. What happened to cabinet deck? How can they close up? Um, a lot of things happened to cabinet deck. Uh -huh. um, She's really good friends with me. Well, I was. With who? Um, the Coxes, who? Don and Sally Cox. Oh, the Coxes. Oh, yeah. I, I misunderstood. Well, the first thing that happened was that that uh, Don had a stroke. Yeah. And and he was really the genius behind the the organization. When I talked about Aquarius, the plant that burned. Yeah. That was Don. Yeah. And Don had the ability to uh, to he was he was very inventive with processes. Uh, uh, you know, he figured out. And his team did it, but he had the idea that you know when you spray wood, you got to wait for it to, the stain to dry. Well, so how do you do that? You know, you, you know, and, uh, and, and it gets dust on one side, and the other side's sticky, and you know you got to do it twice. And so he built a system of tracks that went around the factory and up up in the wasted space. And by the time the piece of wood came back to you, it was dry. So the speed of the track took four hours or whatever the drying time what they were doing for all, and they made a thousand cabinets a day, you know, so it was a high production. And that was his genius and the team of Zing boys and others that, that he hired that were just incredible that did that. Then when he became not able anymore, uh, Sally took over the business, and I think the biggest mistake was she tried really hard, and uh, a, a sweet lady, not a hardcore CEO, didn't want to be yeah. and, and, and Nick did. And so she had a son that wanted to do it, but Nick is 16 years old. And you can't run a 400 employer company with a 16 year old kid mature. Every now and then you'll find a 16 year old could. But Nick brought, you know, put the cabinet in Texas. He bought a Hummer. I was good friends with Nick. He was really, really good friends. He was fine. He was fun, but you know, I don't know what it cost to, you know, he had billboards in Vegas, he had Cabinet Tech logo on the trunks of the MMA fighters, and, you know, he was fun, you know, it was a fun run, but it was not good for the company right now. But that alone didn't do it. What, what really did it 
um, they had they had been having trouble with Zion's Bay. Not because of payment as much as uh, an edict from the prophet that said you can't be unequally yoked with a uh, infidel, that's not infidel, but the, what the, what's the right word? Apostate. You can't be unequally yoked with apostate, an apostate. And so the cabinet tech at that time was owned by Don and Kelly Cox and Phil McAfee. And they all lived in Short Creek. And, and that's where a lot of the roots of the company were. But Phil had left, the first board was in the second board at that point in time. And it fallen away from the core group that ultimately was first, that, that group. Yeah. And, and, um, and so, and Don was still in it, but it wasn't going there, but he was there. And so it was, it, it, and, and, and Phil wanted to quit because his wife was a Jeff. Mm -hmm. And um, she thought she was, I mean, she was taught yeah. that, that, that she was going to go to hell, so he was going to figure it out. And so Phil needed to leave the company and not be unequally yoked to Don and Kelly. And signed a bank And he said, because they'd all signed personal guarantees. And so Zions isn't going to let him out of the company, so they started looking for other means of, of financing to buy Zion Bank out. And it was about $2.1 million, I think. And it, it wasn't all of what they owed. They had other investment capital that was from other sources, a large company in Phoenix and other sources. And all of this was this maneuvering and legal gymnastics was putting huge pressure on, on Sally. And, and um, then additionally, somebody sold them uh, to get rid of the trap because they had to hire, hire volume to dry the stain. Somebody said, you can do this with ultraviolet and you can UV cure a new line of stains that are coming out. Automotive's using it, wood manufacturers are using it. You can cure stain with UV. So they sold them this UV system that would, would cure all the stains. And after they bought it, they paid two million for it. And after they bought it, they found out it had to be done in a clean environment, no particulate in the air, and you're in a wood shop. And so particulate is everywhere. So they had to build screens to screen it off, and none of this was planned capital outlay. And they had to borrow money to do that, and it was expensive to borrow that money. And now their operating expenses are teetering on the they're, they're in tough shape financially. And the pressure on Sally, uh, I was at lunch with him on, uh, I still remember this in, 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 in her eyes. I, she took a phone call, we were at lunch, talking about trying to turn the thing out and bail, around and bail it out. She took a phone call, stepped away from the table, came back and it was one of the bankers, mm -hmm. and it pushed her, she, she quit. She just looked and said, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. And the only option was to close the plant. And there was no way to, if she wasn't gonna drive it, there was no way to keep trying to figure out how to turn it around. And I believe it could have been turned around, but it would have, it, at what cost to her emotionally, uh, or how to extract and put somebody else in there. She had a CFO that they'd hired out of California, whose name escapes me, Bill somebody, uh, who had a good handle, and, and there was a plan could have been done, but it just, it, she was tired. And I saw it in her eyes. I just saw her just shut down and then got relief from having done that. Yeah. Well, I didn't ever really know the whole story. Well, I maybe told you stuff I shouldn't have told. I mean, I, I had asked Nick, but we were done. I mean, I didn't really yeah. maybe care. I well, don't this, know. this was a long time ago, yeah. and, and I'm not sure. Nothing's ever as simple as a story. Right. There's always a lot of complexity to it, and I think probably there were many other things behind the scenes that, that you know spilled into their spiritual life as well. There were lots of things going on in their world. And and uh, you know that's none of us are immune to that stuff. Every company has the same kind of things going family things and stresses and and you know it's a when the when a company's in trouble it's a real task on everybody. And uh, and in this case there were four hundred families that were on them getting it figured out. And it's a shame that, that they didn't because 
everybody didn't land on their feet. You know, a lot of people were damaged through the, the unraveling of the company. Suppliers as well, you know, I mean, not just the company. And, you know, and the real estate's never been fully reutilized correctly. You know, it's been, you know, collected car places and warehouses and some businesses and so forth. Anyway, uh, that's an example of stuff that probably ought to stay confidential in the room. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to be hurt by my opinions. My opinions are just one opinion. It's my assessment. I was there, but I certainly didn't know everything that was going on. Uh, and wish we could have done more. You know, I really wish we could have saved it because that left a hole in St. Louis. At the time, they were the largest employer in St. And, you know, you take any largest employer out of any community, and that leaves a mark. All right, so sorry about that for everybody that got an extra goat trail. <laughs> That was great. All right, I guess it's on tape too, so it'll, it'll, it'll. Uh, I hope anybody that hears that will treat that with the proper uh, respect that old information ought to get. Um, it, nothing can change what happened in the past. It's history, and uh, and I only know a small piece of it. There's probably lots more behind the scenes of, of cause and effect. So we are going to look at this. I, everybody has a copy of these two documents now, correct? Okay, we're gonna go through these two documents on the left. We have this one. Looks like I need to erase a few things, so give me a second to find where I do that. So those of you that weren't here, what we have is four pages that represent the business in Las Vegas, Vegas Supply. And we read in a class, we won't reread it, the story, it's just a couple paragraphs, so make sure you read it, uh, of Vegas Supply. Uh, we, they've been operating, uh, we have, we have uh, three years of operating history in the financial statements. They've been, the last five, they've been doing well. Uh, COVID came along, they survived that. Uh, they've been doing, they've been doing well, except their bank is telling them that they they need to uh, borrow less money. <laughs> kind of just what we were talking about, right? And uh, so they, Bud Ryan, the owner of that company, has agreed to hire you to look at their financial statements, analyze their financial statements, and make a recommendation to him from your point of view of what's okay, what's not okay, what should he do? So the tools we need to do that is we're going to need a calculator. We're going to need to know uh, some ratios. So we're going to have to calculate some ratios. All of these are going to be no more complicated than uh, adding, dividing, and multiplying. So we're all capable of doing that since third or fourth grade. So no, no calculus or advanced theoretical math here on this at all. This is just fundamental things that we're going to look at from the financial statements. Now, we're starting out with the four pages of this document right here. We looked at it together. Let's look at it again. Uh, so this, first of all, is a, try to get it so we can see it. Let me, I was going to put side by side. Let me get it up this big and make it a little bit bigger. Okay. So this document is makes, that's North American classification code, right? Uh, it's a system of, of grouping businesses in like businesses so that you're only comparing, comparing not just a restaurant, but Pizza Hut. I mean, not Pizza Hut, Pizza Joints, right? You're looking at pizza places. And you are stratifying or sorting that data. This one is by asset. And the next page, which I don't have up, was, would be sorting it by sales. We decided in the class sort of at the end before we were done that based on Vegas Supplies financial statements, their assets, uh, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna do it by asset. And so let me just minimize out of here for a second and go to where we had Vegas Supplies. I'm gonna get that up there, I've got a few versions of Vegas supply. Uh, 
Okay, this is what we are going by. That's a one page. Move that down to this is the write up you're going to read. Uh, we did read it together. Uh, but here is the balance sheet for Vegas Supply. Uh, there are a few things that we noted. Uh, we noted that this is three years, 2020, 2021, 2022, and it, all the numbers are in thousands, so this is 24,000. Uh, this, the gray columns, are the percentage of something. And we decided on the balance sheet uh, that 3% for 2020 is a the percent of the total assets, which is this number right here. That's 100%. This column is 100%. This column is 100%. And so, you know, 11% of that is that. 91% uh, of that is that. Uh, whatever, whatever we're seeing in the column. We looked at trends also, just anecdotally at this point. We, we could see something that said that, you know, in 2020, $24,000 in cash on the day, uh, last day of the year, uh, December 31st. And then a year after that, they had 27, things were better. This year, he has 21,000 cash, uh, and it's, 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 down, but look at the percentage number. It's down from 3% of their total assets to 1.1% of their total assets. Is that good or bad? We don't know yet. Um, but, but what we see is their total assets have gone up from 805 to 12, the 1.2 million to 1.9 million. So if we were looking at that statement that I just had open. Uh, that, that looks like it, but that's not it. That's Tesla. So where did I put that? Mm -hmm. far back. Mm -hmm. Oh, it opened in that beautiful thing that's called Bing. I don't know why Bing exists. <laughs> <laughs> my opinion. Uh, all right, thank you for driving me there. <laughs> uh, so, so we're looking at sorted by assets. We said their assets were 1.9 million, and in this class, we have companies that are 500 million to 2 million, and companies that are 2 million to 10 million. He's on a growth mode. He's at just short of 2 million in assets. I said arbitrarily, let's use this column for our comparison data, and I'm going to call it two things. I'm going to call it comparison data. I'm also going to call it target data. Why am I calling it target data? That's what the banks are looking at. That's what the banks are looking at. So if th it's their target, it may not be ours. We may be outperforming the bank's target, in which case that's awesome. I have no problem. We don't have to match what the bank's expecting. But sometimes if we're outperforming what the bank is expecting, that may mean we're using more of our cash than we would have to. Maybe we could grow and invest in that growth by borrowing a little more money than the bank, uh, you know, expect, the bank expects us to owe more money in borrowed money. So maybe why not? So it, 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 all it's going to do is usher a strategic conversation for us to know how we compare in Las Vegas to other companies like ours throughout the United States, throughout North America. So this includes Canada as well. Uh, he's looking at the number of financial statements. There is, there's 200 other companies that they are looking at uh, that, that are in this size range. So I would say if we are comparing ourselves to 200 companies the same size in the same business, we're going to get some information of value. Does that make sense? The automotive industry and the power sports industry, both of those industries are similar but different. Uh, power sports being the side-by-sides, four-by-fours, dirt bikes, uh, that industry, and the automotive industry, we all know what that is. It's been common in the automotive industry 
for uh, dealerships to join something that's called a 20 group. That's just a term that kind of is, is become known as a 20 group and they all, and originally a 20 group had 20 other dealerships like yours. And back in the day we didn't have giant public companies when 20 groups started out. We didn't have giant companies that uh, like uh, CarMax or you know things that sold both new and used and were all over the United States. We didn't have giant companies like that. Dealership, car dealerships, some were big, but they were local, uh, or at least more local. And, and they were more specific to a brand than they were of having like, you know, how many brands does Stephen Wade dealership represent in this market? And in other markets, there's, there's dealerships that have even more brands than that. And, and so um, if the, the 20 group started out with, let's just say Chevrolet, so Chevrolet dealerships, they would find Chevy dealerships around the United States that all sold about the same number of cars a year. And they would get a deal with those 20, with 20 different owners, and they would usually make sure that they weren't in competing marketplaces. So they were in separate markets across the United States selling the same brand, stores about the same size. And they would all cut a deal and shake hands and sign a contract that says, we are going to share our financial data with each other. We're not going to disclose anybody else's financial data, but we are going to look at the 19 other dealerships and compare it to ours and see how our expenses, our budgets are lining up compared to other dealerships our size. Now, when you think about that, if you owned a dealership, wouldn't that be awesome? You could be here in St. George and with your Toyota store and you could compare with one in, in Oregon and one in New Hampshire and one in Texas and, and these, and, and the 20 group would be administered by a consultant, and they still are at this point in time, uh, who is the referee, keeps the, you know, that we got 20 companies with huge egos. You know, our car dealer owners are all huge egos. They own places like, you know, the New Orleans Saints, stuff like that, you know, or the Utah Jazz. You know, I was another car dealer, right? And so these guys had, have egos this big, so getting them all in the one room requires a referee. But they share financial data every month with the other groups in their 20 group. And so we're able to see things um, through 20 group data, if you, it, but it's confidential data, but you're able to see things that you're maybe not doing as well as somebody else is doing, or maybe you're, what you're doing better. How much should you pay a general manager? I don't know. Let's see what these other 19 are paying their general manager. And get an idea if you're in the right ballpark or not. You certainly would learn if you're way overpaying or way underpaying, right? So you get an idea on some labor costs. Uh, they look at numbers in car dealerships like fixed absorption. Fixed absorption is how much of your expenses, your fixed expenses, are being paid for by the service department versus the sales department versus uh, the uh, uh, collision. Uh, those are the three units that are mostly dominant in a car dealership, all contributing dollars. And if if most of your fixed costs of operating are paid by, by the service department, that means all your marketing and sales is essentially free. If you could get that fixed absorption up to 100%, uh, and that's hard to do, but it's doable. There are dealerships around that do that. If I didn't know that it was possible, I wouldn't even be training for that. It was like the four minute mile. Nobody believed anybody could run it in four minutes until somebody did, and then they go, wow. And now everybody but me runs it in four minutes, right? And, and, and so uh, the same with the dealership. If I, I if fixed absorption, if I could get all of my expenses paid for by the service department, wow, that would be awesome. Now I could have online sales, I could have you know my parts, I could be doing all kinds of stuff that is free in terms of, of underlying expense. So, but I, I learned that from a 20 group. Well, the power sports industry started doing the same thing, uh, probably because a lot of power sports companies were owned by a car dealership at some point, or, or they helped finance them and start them up. And that's common practice. There are other industries that have something similar. Hospitals. They don't call them 20 groups. They call them other things. But every, many industries have this. And if, if your industry doesn't, might not be a bad idea 
to think about and talk about could we, should we. There's some important cautions. One caution is make sure you don't violate the Hartley-Patman Act and have collusion of price fixing amongst competitors. So if all the pizza joints in St. George got together and had meetings every month, that'd be awesome, probably illegal because it smacks of price fixing, right? And, and while it's okay to read the price of gas on a gas station, it's not, and, and adjust yours based on what the guy across the street is selling his gas for, it's not legal for you to have a conversation that says, I'm gonna sell at this price, would you agree to sell at that price if we both raise the price simultaneously? That's an illegal conversation, you can't have that. Uh, and that's consumer protection stuff, right? Uh, so we, we're interested in that. So, uh, so if you're in separate markets, so if we got pizza joints together in, you know, in Idaho, uh, one at the store in Idaho, one store in St. George, one store in uh, Reno, and, and we had 20 of those together to talk once a year even, share financial data, you could learn stuff about your industry. This does the same thing. This gives us certain information. It doesn't tell us how much they pay their GM. Some information we may want to dig deeper to get. But this does give us a ratio of how much, uh, how their expenses are lined up, what their labor costs are in some cases, if they're, if they're publishing that uh, in the data, because we're going to look at, at what, their, what their inventory levels really are. How much inventory should you have if you are a department store? You need one of these to see what other department stores your size have in terms of dollars of inventory. Fortunately, in department stores, you can look at the gap or you can look at public companies and see what they have in inventory because their financials are public. You don't have to sneak to get their financials. Uh, so Christensen's has an advantage because Dillard's numbers are public. Christensen's aren't. So that's one advantage. They have a lot of buying power disadvantage, right? But, but they, have, they, 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 they should be looking at how much money is Dillard's at the mall paying in sales tax uh, because that gives them an idea of what their sales really are. And if they can get that information, that's a value to Christensen's here. So you can look at competitive information that way. This is a good way just to get it all across the United States. So we're going to be looking at this column. And we are going to be, when we see uh, certain numbers in that column, we need to understand what those numbers mean. Let's, let's go here. We were looking at ratios. These are all ratios now at this point. It says so in the heading. So the top of it was your, your financial statement and your balance sheet. So assets, cash, receivables, inventory, other current, total current, then our non-current stuff, uh, our liabilities. So this and this have to match uh, with net worth in there. Uh, so this matches this. The bottom of both those match. Uh, this is a balance sheet. Then we have this is the P&L, or the, uh, the income statement, and the important lines of the income statement are here. And with this data, we can then figure ratios. And when we figured ratios, and we're going to do those, uh, for the current ratio and the quick ratio, and for sales receivable for most of these ratios, you see three lines. So we got this far, this is where we ended class. We have three numbers, 3.2, 1.9, and 1.4. What that means, the middle number, 1.9, that's the median, the, the, the average. That's the 50% point of all 200 of those financial statements. The 3.2 is the upper quartile, and the 1.4 is the lower quartile. That means a quartile is a quarter up, right? A quarter up. So the bottom quarter, the top quarter, and the middle. We are going to use for our calculations, in all cases, the middle number. So we'll disregard this, disregard that, we'll use that. And it's grayed out here. We'll disregard that, disregard that, we'll use that. Disregard this, disregard this, use that. And as you can see, on some of these ratios, there's quite a big difference between the average and the best or between the average and the worst. So you can still be in the business and be on the low end or be on the high end. Yes, sir? So I have a quick, the high, when you say the high and the low, isn't, isn't the 1.4% aren't those the better business than the 3.2? Uh, 
Now we're getting into interpreting what the ratio means. And, and the answer is maybe, uh, but the answer isn't categorical in almost any of these. Almost all of them we need to look at the impact of that number in reference to the other numbers that we're going to look at. And that's the trick of what we're going to do the rest of the, of the analysis is we're going to look at pieces of it and see how they fit together. So looking at one number isn't enough for us to buy stock in a company. So they got a lot of cash. That's awesome. Are they sharing it? <laughs> what are they doing with it? Are they making, are they growing with it? Are they making more profit with it? What's the future looking like? Or are they, are they just funding a Swiss bank account with their cash and it has no impact on the shareholder? It's still an asset, but in reality, they're going to siphon it off as soon as they can. So one number alone doesn't give us the big picture. We want to see as many of the numbers as we can, and even then, uh, I think there's a, a, a Bible verse that says, even though we look through a glass darkly, you know, the dark, the glass is, is murky. The, 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 our future is not clear. The company's position isn't clear. You can lie with numbers. You can lie with statistics. Uh, but this is the best we got. And we're trying to see between the lines what is the true health of our business. We're doing this for our business. Uh, or if we're analyzing a supplier or a customer, we might do it for that as well. All right, so, so we have an understanding a little bit of what is on these pages. Uh, and so the second page of it is the same data, but this time it's stratified by sales volume. And so we could be looking at the column in sales uh, volume as well as looking at a column in assets. Uh, it's, it's, it's good for your company to look at both of those. That's why RMA gives you both of those pieces of data because some companies do it asset lean and they run a strong business because they don't own their building. They don't own their equipment. They, they, they get it you know, a, a lean way. And that and their sales uh, might, you know, so they, they maybe they are a healthy company looking at sales, less healthy looking at assets, but that's on purpose. They're trying to not use their own assets and tie up their own money in assets. They're trying to tie up their money in producing sales. And so we need to look at both for a company, usually, and for your company, you'd want to look at both. For us looking at Vegas supply in this class, we're going to base it off of assets. Just so that's, just so we all get the same answers on what we're doing and we go through the process. Then later you can go back and look at it by sales and see is it different or not. So that's what we have um, with uh, page one and that's what we're going to dwell on for starters. Now let me go back to, um, to this sheet, uh, which is our ratio analysis worksheet for Vegas supply. So this is their balance sheet first page. This is their income statement, the second <coughs> page of numbers. And those are the only two we're looking at. We're not looking at statement of cash flow. What we want to do now is we want to, to work the ratios. After we've done the ratios, we want to look at the impact. So right now, we're going to look at the actual for Vegas supply and we're going to compare it to the target, and the target we get from these sheets over here. Okay, so let's let's go through some examples. Uh, I mean, let's just plug and chug and go through this document, and let's see if we can get everybody in agreement on the numbers. Uh, we'll start with the very first ratio, which we kind of did in class, and I'd like you to kind of help your neighbor. As we do, we're going to go through them slow, and we're going to go through them together as a class, but help your neighbor, because it's really easy for us to get lost on a number. And I don't want anybody to get lost. I want us to all come together. We have uh, 16 or 17 people in the room, and I don't want somebody at the end of class to go, I completely got bamboozled. I have no idea what we just did. So help your neighbor out. And make sure we all come through this and we maybe don't understand the why or what the ratios mean. We'll talk about that later. Right now we're just talking about the number and getting a number. So let's, let's walk through what we have. Uh, the first thing they want us to calculate is they want us to calculate the current ratio 
and the current ratio is calculated by finding current assets, dividing it by current liabilities. Where do we find assets and liabilities? On the balance sheet. On the balance sheet. So we're going to go to Vegas Supplies balance sheet, and we're going to look for the number that says current assets and current liability. For the current year. For the current year, thank you. Yes, for, well, the, the, the last year that we have, right. which is 2022. Um, so to do that one, let's go over to the, the, the uh, financial statement. And we're going to need current assets and current liabilities. From the balance sheet, it says here that the total current assets is 1769. Right? Okay, 1769. So you write on the worksheet above this line, you write 1769 right here. On your, on your worksheet. And then underneath that, you're going to write the number that is the current liabilities. So we go back to the balance sheet and we see current liabilities of this line, current liabilities, 1504. I'll see them right here, 1504. Current liabilities, 1504. So back to our worksheet. We have 1769 divided by 1504. Now, some people, for ease of decimal points, divide both those numbers by 1,000 right off the bat and round a little bit. And if you did that, you could say 1.77 divided by 1.51 or something, or 50. You, could, you, know, you can round however you want to round understand if you do round, you may get a slightly different number than the rest of the people in the room get. So it's based on how you round. If you don't want to round, take 1769 divided by 1504. And what do you get when you do that? 1.18. So you're going to put 1.18 in this column right here. 1.18. All right. So we've done 1769 divided by 1504, giving us 1.18. These numbers came right off the balance sheet. This is a simple computation. The target is the target current ratio. What does the bank say your current ratio should be? Your bank says it should be, I'm on, I'm on column three. I'm on current ratios. I'm on the middle number, 1.9. So I write 1.9 in the target box. Okay, I write 1.9 right here. Everybody, yes, ma'am. I missed something early on. Why did we choose the third column on the? Because that's stratified by asset size. And so we looked at, so this is by assets. So this is data sorted by assets. And from the financial statement, Vegas supplies assets, total assets are 1.934 million. So we rounded that up to two. Oh, you rounded it, okay. Yeah, we rounded it up. So yeah. okay. we, and you're right, we had that conversation at the end of last class, we were in. So we just elected to round it up. Okay. Um, uh, we don't have to. We could use the neighboring column. Uh, your bank might use the neighboring column. Your bank might use going the other direction. And so I'm going to want to know how my bank split our numbers so that if they didn't do it the way I did it, I can argue with them based on you know, if they're getting a different answer than I'm getting. So, so that's where it came from. It was an arbitrary rounding. Okay. That place that they're based on, based on this number of total assets, 1934, and the column being grouped by assets of two to ten million 
I said 1934 is closer to 2 million than it is to 500,000. So I don't want to get them grouped in with the small businesses. I'd rather get them grouped in with a little bit bigger businesses. Because that's the direction I want them to go. I want them to grow and get, get more. So these are the tr more true competitors that we want to mirror we, or beat. You know, that's, so that's where that came from. So please speak out when you get questions like that because I want everybody uh, to be in agreement with what we are learning and doing here. So the next ratio that we want to calculate. And so right now, from the answers that we got of 1.18 versus 1.9, 1.9 is a bigger number than 1.8, but what does that mean? It means that our current assets to current liabilities is closer to 1. It means we got less available cash than if it's at 1.9. Our competitors have more cash to deal with because they've got a bigger ratio of that. Does that make sense? But, but we don't have to understand all the ratios yet. We're going to look into them in a while. But right now, a quick ratio uh, says... What is our cash plus accounts receivable? Because that's considered a quick ratio because cash, I should be able to go to the bank and draw it out. Mm -hmm. And my accounts receivable, I should be able to make a few phone calls and get people to pay. So I have access to quicker liquidity or quicker cash by a quick ratio. So that kind of gives me more, you know, I don't have to have a long-term sale to sell a dump truck that might be reflected. Uh, as a, uh, a current asset. Uh, and, and, and so quick ratio is another ratio. We'll explain most of these later. This one's we're going to require an add addition and a division. We're going to use the same number we used earlier for current liabilities, uh, which is 1504. Right? We have 1504 uh, down here. That same number is going to be used in this ratio. So you can write 1504 down here, but we're going to go back to the balance sheet and see how much cash and how much accounts receivable do we add together there. So what's the cash position based on the balance sheet? We read that it was, did we say 21,000? Yeah. Okay, cash is 21,000, accounts receivable is 612,000. See both of those numbers here on the balance sheet, 21,000 and 612,000 that people owe us. So the ratio said add those two numbers together, and that should give you 633, or something close to that, right? Yep. And divide it by the 1504, and that number is going to be what? 0.42. That's the number that you're going to write in this target box for line number two of quick ratio. I, I'm sorry, not the target. You're going to write it in this box under 2022. You're going to write the number. I wish I could draw on this and have it scroll and keep. It'd be a lot easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> but I can't. Um, so that's going to be 0 uh, 0.42. Now we need. Now we do need to write something in the target number. And the target number that we want is the quick ratio. And sometimes they call these the same as we call them, and sometimes we have to do a little thinking about what they call it. So in this case, under ratios, they call it quick ratio. So if they call it the quick ratio, uh, and we're using the middle number of the set, third column, that number is 0.9. Do we see that? So quick ratio. Third column still, 0.9. So the target quick ratio is 0.9. What we have is far less close to 1. Our, the target that we have, I mean, the, the, uh, what we actually have is 0.42. 0.42 in under 2022 column and 0.9 under the, the target column. Okay? We all together so far? We've got those uh, two formulas and four numbers written in our worksheet. We're now going to go to safety ratio. Uh, the safety ratio is our debt to equity. You heard him talking about that on the slides, on the video if you watch. Just watch. I stopped it there. 
and we talked a little bit about that. It's calculated as total liabilities divided by equity. We have not used either one of those numbers. Don't get fooled. We've used current liabilities, not total liabilities. But both of those numbers should come from what? The balance sheet. The balance sheet. The balance sheet. All right. Total liabilities on the balance sheet. Total liabilities. 1504, which is also the same as their current liabilities. What does that tell you about Bud and his liabilities? Just for yucks and grands, what does that tell us? He has no long-term liabilities. Well, that's going to show up differently in ratios. Sometimes a company wants to move some current liabilities into long-term liabilities. What that would be was taking short-term debt, refinancing it for a longer period, right? So it moves it into a different spot on the balance sheet. We're not going to do that yet, but that, but we know there are no current liabilities, so we're using uh, I, there's no long-term liability, so we're using 1504, which interestingly is the same number we use for total current liabilities, and why it's the same number is only because he's not reporting any long-term debt on his balance sheet, okay? On my balance sheet at home, if I have a mortgage for, and I owe 22 more years on a house, that's long-term debt, right? So it would be on my balance sheet in a different spot than current. The current liability would be what I owe in the first year, which is what my mortgage payments times 12 would be for this year. That would be my current liabilities of that mortgage note. The long-term would be all the rest of it. So it could be a good thing or it could it, it's another a question. One of, Absolutely, it's another one of those things that could bite you or could be available to you. But it just is what it is at this point. So we're using 1504 uh, for total liabilities. What are we using for equity? We're using, do you see 430 right there? On the line that says equity, 430. So we're writing 1504 on the top line. Fifteen oh four on the top line, and we are dividing that by four thirty on the debt to equity line, and that division gives us what? Three point four nine. Three point four nine. I rounded mine to three point five. Um, it's sixes if you want to do that or don't. Um, it, it 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 it's fine either way. They used uh, our history record is one point seven. 2.39, and now we're going to write in there uh, 3.49 or 3.5, whichever you want to write here. Okay, and that's done from simply taking the total liabilities of 1504 divided by the equity of 430, and that gives us that number. And now we want to know what the target number is. The target number is going to come back from our uh, uh, our statements from RMS data. The, the number we're looking at here is liabilities versus equity. Where do we find that number at? Can that be the debt plus work? Let's have some, some discussion about that. Okay. Total liabilities divided by equity. Anybody, we have a vote for this line that says debt divided by work. Yes. That sound right? Everybody vote for that one? Good, good pickup. We had to hunt elsewhere. It wasn't just nicely going down the line on our RMA day. So it's a debt versus worth, and the number that we're finding is 1.4. In agreement on that? Okay. So we're at 3.5, and the doctor thinks we ought to be at 1.4. All right. So that's a that's a different number. Going on down on our sheet, we are next looking for gross profit margin. That's an interesting number to know. Most, most retailers know what their profit margin is. Your boss might not know what your profit margin is. Well, here's how you can show them how to figure it out. Uh, and this is, this is your profit margin big picture. Because bosses often go, uh, how much wood do we got in that? 
you know, how much do we pay for that? And didn't ask how much scrap there is. It didn't ask how much time it took you to put it all together. So we get a we get a skewed number for our profit margins a lot of times. Companies go, we try to double our money. Well, that's really hard to do. Uh, companies do do it. Not don't don't you know don't fool me. Companies do do it. But uh, knowing what our profit margin is, this one is harder to argue with because we're looking at our gross profit divided by our sales. Gross profit divided by our sales. Where are we going to find those numbers? We're going to the income statement now, not the balance sheet. Income statement says our gross profit is, it's got it in bold lever, letters, it says it's 1,058. You see that? Okay, so 1,058 goes on that top line on line four, and on the bottom line, we put our sales number. Where's our sales number found? That's the top line, 4504. So our gross profit margin, what does it mean when it says gross? Before taxes. Like, ooh, gross. It's not that gross, is it? No. It's, it's the biggest number, right? It's, after, it's before you, you subtract out all other costs of doing business. So your gross margin, not your real margin. Walmart's gross margin is way, way bigger than their net margin after taxes. Net margin after taxes is in the range of 2%. Gross margin is in the range of 45, 50%. Right? And so the, the costs in between are significant if you own as much and have to pay as much as Walmart does for the, you know, they get 75 lawsuits a day at Walmart. Uh, you know, and so, you know, that costs money to, to, to defend. You know, some of them are real, some of them are frivolous. Anyway, we are taking 1050. Eight, dividing it by 4504, and what number are we getting? So be careful about this. When you get 0.235 or something, maybe, or 2.33, 2.34, somewhere around that range. Now, these numbers are 24% and 24, 24.8 and 24 in previous years, and we just said we're getting 23.5-ish. Uh, but we said 0.234, so what do we have to do to convert that to percent? Multiply times 100. Yeah, multiply. So we take that 0.234 that we got, move the decimals over to, to get a percentage out of it. Because this is percentage that we're looking for. So the, the, mar the gross profit margin is respectable, but it's sneaking down, right? It's, it's a 24.8 to 24.0 to 23 point something. Right? And, but what's the target? Are we doing okay or is that kind of in line with what everybody else is doing? Where did we find that? We found that on the debt to worth. No, that's not debt to worth. We're looking at gross profit margin. Where's our gross project profit margin at? Uh, it said gross profit on income data. What line are we on? Uh, let's look and let's find our proper line here. Where did you get 22.2 at? Um, it says income data. Income data. Gross profit. No, we're, you're, you guys are too high up. Too high up. 24.9? Let's work on this a little bit. Gross profit at the second one. Let's work on it a little bit. Gross profit divided by sales. Gross profit divided by sales. Let's just put a little question mark there for a minute. We'll come back to it. Let's see, let's see what, what else we get with. We may have another thing that's a question mark before we get to that. Let's go to the next line. And let's go profit before tax divided by sales 
What is our profit before tax? And what is our sales? We just used that number? 4504. So let's do that one. What do you got? 1.99. So let's run that to 2%. Mm -hmm. Let's put that in that box. And let's look for what is our target. Profit before tax divided by the sales. Did you say 3.4? Yeah. Where'd you get that number at? That's, that's it, right? Profit before tax divided by sales as a percent. You said 3.4 percent? Okay, based on that answer, let's back up to the square above it. Because I think you were on the right track. Say again what you said on the square above it. Gross profit margin, gross profit divided by sales. You said 22.2% you said, and, and you said you found that number up here, yeah. and we said you go too high, you went too high to find it. You did not go too high to find it. You found it, so let's go back and let's explain the out loud to everybody where, where you found that number and what you were looking at. We're looking at gross profit divided by sales. Um, where it shows income data. Okay. And just two under that, it says gross profit. And then if you follow that gray bar uh, where it has two to ten million in those companies, just under, well, if you follow it all, all the way across, it says 22.2. .2. So we're right here. This is 22.2 .2 of what? Of a hundred. Of net sales. Yeah. So when you're basically to sum that up, when you're going off the income statement, you look at the income data. When you're going off the balance sheet, you look at the assets and liabilities. You got to look at the so far. We're gonna we're gonna have a curve to that a little bit later. Okay. But so far that's correct. And so what you did is go up to the income to this income data here, and they already did a percent for us. Gross profit of net sales is this, because uh, net sales is a hundred percent, right? Mm -hmm. So see how they, how they got that? We just did the same thing. God, you're not going to be at Best Buy for long. <laughs> Okay, um, all right, that's some accomplishment, that's good. Let's flip the page and let's keep going, because we've got... So that's the target, 22.2 is the target. Okay, yeah, let's, let's make sure everybody's got that. Gross profit margin, actual is 23.5 is what I have down, or four, nine, and the gross profit target is 22.2. .2. What that says is, we're beating what the bank is expecting on profit margin, gross profit margin. So it's not all bad news, right? And that's why Bud is saying, why do I have to have a consultant come in? Our numbers aren't bad. And, and they're not bad. But there's some things that we can do to make the business stronger, right? All right, so, and then for the bottom of page four, we should have 2.0 percentage for our actual pre-tax margin and the bank is expecting us to have almost double that, 3.4% margin, right? So again, we're not looking at any one of these alone. We're gonna look at all of them as they work together in a while. But right now, we're just figuring out individual ratios. And, and for yucks and grins, we're seeing how we compare to the bank, right? Okay, that takes us to page five, and I want to get us through page five and six if we can before we go home. Uh, so I think we can, and if we get done early, we'll go home early, okay? So we're gonna be looking at sales to assets. To find sales to assets, where are we looking? We'll 
We're going to find sales on the income statement. Where are we going to find assets? Back on the balance sheet. So on the sales, we've already used this number before. It's the top line. Of, it's 4504. And the total assets, oddly enough, we've used that number before. It is 1934. So we take 4504 divided by 1904, I mean, so 1934, and you get what? 2.32. 2.32, 2.33, somewhere in that range. And then now, how do we find the target? Sales to total assets. Sales to total assets is, a, is an actual ratio that has three, has the average, the high and low, and that is, the average is 3.2. So we don't have any sleuthing to do on that one. It is what it says, sales to total assets. All right, you should have 3.2, and looking at that, our numbers aren't maybe as good as they need to be uh, at 2.3, we're quite a bit south of what the bank is expecting to see. Return on assets. All right, that number we need to go to profit before tax. And we need to divide that by the total assets number we just used. So profit before tax is found where? In the income. income statement, profit before tax. Profit before tax. That's a line item that says profit before tax. And the number on that is? 90. 90. So we take 90 divided by 1934, and we get 4.7. Mm -hmm. Close to that? 4.6. 4.6, okay, I'll go with that. And then to find the return on assets from our RMA data, return on assets. Do we see return on assets there? Eight point four. Eight point four. Where'd you find that at? Um, profit before tax by total asset. Profit before tax by total assets. Right here. Percent profit before tax divided by total assets. It looks a little funny that way, doesn't it? Yes. You had to do some sleuthing to figure that out. Net a percent profit before taxes divided by total assets giving you eight point four what? Percent. Eight point four percent. That's what the bank's looking at. I'm giving them 4.6. Right, that's, that's less than what the bank is expecting. Even though my profit's gone up, remember? This is, this is what's interesting. So now we want to know what return on equity is. Return on exit equity is another ratio. Return on equity is calculated by looking at our profit before tax, which is the number we used on the line above it which is 90, and divided by the equity, which is a number we used before also. And equity comes from where? The income. Equity the comes from? Sheet. The balance sheet. The balance sheet. And it's a line item that says equity on it. And the number we pulled out of that was 430. So the, re the return on equity is 90 divided by 430. And that equals what? 20.9%. 20%. 0.9 percent. Okay. 90 divided by 430, 20.9. As we look at those three numbers year to year to year, we see the return on equity going up. That's a good trend. Banks should be happy with that trend. Our return on equity is going up. Uh, however, RMA says our return on equity ought to be what? 24.9. Where did you get 24.9 at? Could we call that yes? Well done. That is yes. This is the line we're looking at. Percent profit before taxes divided by tangible net worth, which we haven't even used that word tangible. 
That's the first time there. Uh, and, and lots of items on our balance sheet might have uh, custom words like that on them that, that throw us off a little bit, but then stop and think of what it is that they're looking at. Our tangible net worth, that's our equity, right? That's not the blue sky. That's our actual, uh, you, we, could, we could put our finger on that equity. And that is 24.9%, which is still, uh, even though we're showing a trend in that direction, it's still not what the bank is expecting. Our trend is looking correct, but the number's not as big as the bank wants. Now, looking at inventory turnover. Remember when the video we watched said that Apple was turning their inventory over every three days? Wow. That's fast turnover. That's lightning fast turnover. Every now and then we'll see turnover in that range, uh, usually for a product line, not for the whole company. But, but in this case, the inventory turnover is, is calculated by looking at our overall cost of goods sold, dividing it by our inventory. So where do those two numbers come from? The cost of goods sold. Is that cost of sale plus inventory? Cost of goods sale sold. What do you, what do you think? An income statement. Uh, or cost of goods sold. It's coming from the income statement where it says cost of goods sold. And, the inventory and it gives us a gone. number of 34.46 on that one. Yeah. Right? Okay. Target, we're together on that. The and oh, you share the target. We'll save that. Help us out in a minute. Uh, so now we want to take the cost of goods sold of 34.46, and we want to divide that by our inventory. Where do we find our inventory? On the balance sheet. So we go from the income statement for one of those answers, we go to the balance sheet for the other answer, which is our inventory, which is under our assets. It's a line item under assets that says 1121. So we take 3,446,000 or 34,46, cost of goods sold, divided by 1121. Now we are looking at a lump sum number for the whole year. We're not looking at this week's inventory turnover or last week's inventory turnover. We're looking at the whole year. How often do we flip our inventory here? And this is a number all of us really need to know. Uh, some of us have higher inventory levels than others and it becomes more and more important. Uh, in prior years, what was the number, what did that number come out to? 3.4.2, 3 3.9, and now we're 3.07. 3.07 is what you got, I rounded that up, give them a break at 3.1. And what is the units of that? 3.1 what? Times. 3.1 times per what? Year. Per year. 3.1 times per year, they sell out all of the inventory and have to replace it. Three times, 3.1 times a year. All right, that's good until you see that they're sitting on inventory on average four months. Now somebody might think a little different about that, right? And, and so um, 3.1 times per year. However, Mindy, you found what the bank is expecting. What's the bank thinking we could do on inventory? 6.9, and she asked with a question mark because that's such a much bigger number than the 3.1 that we just calculated. Is six and 6.9 is a number, where did you get that from? The cost of sales and inventory. Cost of sales versus inventory. Okay, that's the same as cost of goods sold that I have inventory, right? So she found that and came up with the average at 6.9, 6.9 what? Time, time times, per times per year. year. So is 3.1 times per year better or worse than 6.9 times per year? It's, it's like half as, half as worse as you know, whatever. It's, it, they, they should be flipping their inventory twice as fast as they are. 6.9 times per year, that's you know flipping it just less than every two months. And they're they're at four months. Right? So so that's and you know that's an arguable number. Some of it flips fast. They get deliveries every week and they keep burn through it. But some of it flips slow. And so this is the all the pool of all of the inventory added together, including the fast stuff, 
including the slow stuff. And so what that says is we need to maybe have a talk. Uh, now let's look at the inventory term days. We know how many times a year, and I already told you kind of what it is in days. Uh, I said just less than two months. But let's figure out how many days. So we could take 365 on line 10, 360 divided by inventory turnover. So what found, where do we find the inventory turnover? You just calculated it. It's not going to be on the income statement of the balance sheet. You just calculated it. So the inventory turnover is line 9. And so you put that number in uh, on line 10. So 365 divided by that number tells you what is that? What is the result? 365 divided by 3.1. 118. 118 days. I mean, 118 what? Days. All right. It takes 118 days for them to flip their inventory. What's the target? 365 divided by the target inventory from line nine of 6.9. So 365 divided by 6.9 is 52. 52. Point something or 53 days. So that's less than two months, right? So they're turning their whole, the bank wants you to turn it every 53 days. You're turning it every 118 days. The bank says you're tying up money in sluggish turnover of inventory. For sure, the bank's saying that. All right, accounts receivable turnover, ratio number 11. This one we're going to look at sales divided by accounts receivable. The sales divided by accounts receivable. Sales are where? Income statement, where? Top line on the income statement, 4504. We've used that number a bunch of times. 4504 divided by accounts receivable, where is that? That's an asset on the balance sheet. Right, so go to the, the accounts receivable is the second line under assets on the balance sheet. The number is 612. So write 4504 divided by 612. Crunch that and tell me what you got. 7.35. 7.35 or 7.4 if you want to round upwards. 7.4 what? times per year. So my accounts receivable are turning over 7.4 times per year. What's my target? 13.4. 13.4. Where did you get that, Brock? I got that at sales divided by receivables. Sales divided by receivables. Right under, right under the quick ratio. That was the one we wanted to go to way back when, right? And we're looking at the average number on that. And we are looking at 13.4. I somehow got us on the wrong column here. Where am I at? There we go. Sales. Right. right there. Wow. Yeah. My mouse is stuck. My mouse is on a treadmill. All right, there we go. Sales to receivables. I'm looking at 13.4. 13.4 what? times per year. per year. All right, so bank says we ought to be uh, uh, turning over the money people owe us 13.4 times per year. We're actually doing a 7.4, which is not as good. All right, what's our target? This is our collection period. Our, the, how long does it take us to get our money? We've got to do a simple mathematic gymnastic here on line 12. We're taking 365 Divided it times the AR turn over, the accounts receivable turn over. So 365 divided by 7.35. Divided by 7.35 because you got that number from line 11. the line above it, right? Okay, so here we are. We've got uh, 7.4 written in line 11 with 13.4 times. Our accounts receivable turnover is 365 divided by 7.4, and that gives us what? 49 days. 49 days. 49 days is how often we collect a bill. 
on average for the year. Some faster, some longer. The bank tells us what? 27 days. 27 days, and how did you calculate that? Uh, 365 divided by 13.4. Exactly. 365 divided by 13.4 gives you, the bank says we ought to be collecting money in less than 30 days. And it's taken us 49 days. That's a few weeks longer than the bank thinks that it ought to take us to get our customers to pay their bills. All right, we have two more to calculate and we're done for the night. Tiny bit early. Number, <laughs> number 13, cost of goods sold. We've used that number before. What did we find it to be? 3446. 3446. And the cost of goods sold comes from the income statement of the balance sheet. Income statement. The income statement, cost of goods sold, 3446, divided by our accounts payable. Where does that number come from? Balance sheet. That's a liability. Our accounts payable is 602 on the balance sheet under liabilities. 602 liabilities. So 30, what did I say, 3446? Yeah. 3446 divided by 602 gives you what? 5.7. 5.7 you put in line 13 under our actual. Now where are we going to find the target? Cost of goods sold divided by accounts payable. The cost account of sales payable. Where do you see that at? It's on the cost of sales to the payable. It's and what's the number we get? 26.4. 26.4 what? Times. Times per year. year. We are targeting that our accounts payable should be paid 26.4 times a year. We're only paying 5.7 times per year. How many days is that? That's the last calculation we need to do. 365 divided by the answer in line 13 of 5.7. That tells us our accounts payable are how many days? 64 days. We're paying our bills every two months. That means we got, we've got vendors with their hair on fire. Oh, well, sure, Mike, because Apple's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> when we're as big as Apple, we can do it too. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. We're, we're shooting for what Apple says. I'm shooting for Apple, Apple yeah. Weeks ago. What does the bank think that we ought to have the money to be able to do? 14. Every 14 days. We got that by taking 365 divided by 26.4 from the line above it, that gives us every 14 days. All right, what we are gonna do with that is on page seven, eight, and nine. And we will do that on Tuesday. And now we will be able to put on our thinking hat as a consultant and say, but here's what we see. We've, we've never crunched all the ratios that not all, there's more ratios than that. But we've, we've never crunched some in, interesting ones. How's your turnover look? How fast are you having uh, to hold the stuff that you buy before you can get it sold? And after you get it sold, how long is it taking your customers to pay you money? And once you get money, how long is it taking you to pay the people you owe? And in a healthy company, you should be able to do that fast, even if Apple chooses to do it slow because they can't. Uh, our businesses are, we're not able to do that anymore. Uh, we have, you know, and, and it's a juggling act all the time when your cash flow is tight. It's a juggling act to who do you pay? You, you, and you get to learn who you can stretch out and who you can't. Some people will shut you down, shut you off, put you on COD, uh, require cash up front and not be able to buy on open account. This changes our financial capabilities, doesn't it? So the bank wants us to be healthy enough to choose and healthy enough to show that we're healthy enough by being quick on paying our bills. We have general contractors in this town that build houses that in this labor market have a really hard time finding workers. You put a framing crew together, uh, it's all about how much you're paying today and people are stealing framing crews and, and, and one of the factors that determines whether a concrete crew or framing crew will come to work for you as a general contractor is what is your reputation about paying them? 
Do you string them out or do you pay them fast? And as a general contractor, if you get a reputation that you don't pay well, the suppliers in town don't want to sell you stuff, the workers in town don't want to work for you. If they have a choice of going somewhere where they're, they get their money faster. And this is a factor. So the bank cares because we're stronger if we can choose. And we're weaker if the market chooses, either the customers, suppliers, or employees. Those are all three markets that we're dependent on. All right, so well done. I think is everybody together, if, you, if you're if you fuzzy on something and, don't, and don't, didn't follow and don't want to say it in class, hang out a little bit afterwards or text me and I'll get you on the same page. I want everybody to feel comfortable because what we did was rocket science. It's not rocket science. Pretty easy stuff, wasn't it? But it, it'll razzle and dazzle your accountant if you're able to start talking about the impacts of these ratios and what they mean on your financial statement. And that's where we're headed. You're going to be experts on this. So have a good weekend, and we will see you on Tuesday. Bring this worksheet, because uh, I won't have enough handouts. Uh, break this worksheet so we can finish it. <laughs>